go ahead and call to order the uh, Thursday, June 25th, 2020 meeting of the Clive City Council. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Sarxena. Here. Council members Klein. Okay. Have a seat. Okay. Here. Edwards. Here. McCoy. Here. Judkins. Here. And Weaver. Here. Thank you. All present and accounted for. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you for those who are joining us um, live on Zoom this evening. Good to have you with us. Uh, what I'd like to do now is have uh, young uh, Karen Kuthavali uh, say the pledge for us. And Karen, uh, tell us where you're going to school and what grade you're in. I'm going to be a ninth grader at Prairie View in Waukee. That's great. How long have you been a scout? I've been a scout since first grade. I started Cub Scouts. I've been all the that way through. That's awesome. Good for you. Congratulations. Keep up the great work. And if you'd be so kind now to lead us in the pledge, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you, young man. Great job. And uh, best of luck to you as you pursue scouting in school. Take good care. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, the next item is approval of the agenda. We have several noted changes uh, that I'll speak to. Uh, item AE, uh, we'll need to pull that and set that aside for discussion. Uh, item AH and AI also need to be pulled for discussion. And item AQ also needs to be pulled for discussion. Move approval with the amendments. Second. Uh, moved, moved by John, seconded by Eric. Is there further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Those, those opposed? Okay, those agenda items are, are uh, consent agenda items are passed. So I'm going to move to item AE. And this is uh, uh, involving a resolution approving a change order number three for Mainline Construction Incorporated, Park, or excuse me, Clark Street, phase one. Excuse me, Mary, did we have a system presentation? Yes, we did. I jumped right right over to those. Thank you, John. So uh, I'm going to back to, up, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Mayor, that was actually approval of the agenda. We have not approved consent items yet. Yeah, is, that is correct. So, we, so we've so we approved the agenda, uh, and we've made the, the noted changes, and then we'll get to the consent items in just a moment. <clears throat> so then the next item would be a citizen's presentation. This is where Anyone can address the council on an item that is not on the agenda this evening. Is there Mayor, anybody here to do so? Please advise Pete. Mayor, we have a hand up. I believe this is from you, Mr. Robert or Carter Scanlon. Mr. Scanlon, can you hear me all right? Yep. Please Mr. go ahead. Scanlon, thank you. If you please state your name and address for the record. Yep, my name is Carter Scanlon and my address is uh, 1280 Country Club Boulevard, Clive, Iowa. Well, good evening, Carter. Thank you for joining us. Uh, what's on your mind? Yep. So today I received a letter in the mail um, regarding uh, the fact that I have chickens. Um, and I've had chickens um, for over three years in my backyard. Um, and I just got a letter today about that. Um, and I know it's been a topic of um, conversation um, in the council, just if they should be allowed or not. Um, so I wanted to bring a few points up. Um, about my chickens and just give you a bit of a backstory of why I have them. Um, so I initially bought them to help with my anxiety and also just to have a pet um, that would be cool and something different. Um, and when I got my chickens initially, uh, the covenants in my neighborhood was expired. Um, so many people were getting swimming pools and other things during this time, like getting chickens, um, since it was allowed during that time. Um, and the coop that I have is tucked away under my deck and it's out of sight. Um, and I just have seven hens in my backyard. Um, they're silky chickens. Uh, I'm not sure if people know what those are, but 
they're very quiet chickens um, and my neighbors are aware of them. Um, and I even provide eggs for my neighbors often. Um, and that kind of brings me to my point of why I think they should be allowed, especially right now. Um, with the pandemic, there is a large shortage of eggs and also an increase of price um, because people are hoarding these eggs and also um, the production and shipping of the eggs isn't as um, easy as it used to be. Um, so I think by having chickens, um, it allows people to have quick, quick access to these eggs. Um, and I'd also like to bring to attention um, that I'm part of a program called the Animal Rescue League Therapets. Um, in this program, currently, I have a pet rabbit, um, and I bring him around to nursing homes in Clive um, to visit with residents and people in rehab to brighten their day um, and make them smile. And I did have the same plans to um, do the same thing with my chickens. Um, I've trained them to come to me when they're called. I have different names for all of them. They're all trained to be nice around humans um, and are definitely quiet. So I was actually preparing to get them into this program so I could take them around Clive um, and enhance the lives of citizens um, and just brighten their day. Um, and I also just wanted to bring it to attention as well um, that I guess I've had them for three years and they mean a lot to me. I know they're just chickens to most people, but I mean, they all have personalities to me and I've had a lot of fun having them. So it was obviously very upsetting um, to get this letter because I thought it was allowed. Um, and another idea I do have um, with chickens, I know I've been a part of the Clive Greenbelt goat program. And I think I could see potential with there being chickens um, to help get rid of those invasive species on the green belt while also providing eggs to our community for maybe people that aren't able to spend that extra money, especially during this pandemic, um, to buy those necessities um, of eggs. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I have for today. Okay, thank you, Carter. And I appreciate you uh, bringing this to us and I appreciate the creative ideas you've shared. Uh, uh, with the things that you're doing with uh, not only your chickens but but your but rabbits and and, and other and other animals as well, so I, I appreciate your passion there. I uh, I guess I'm going to start with Matt uh, uh, for direction on this one because um, uh, there's several points and this touches uh, obviously several areas across our spectrum. So Matt, do you have anything? Uh, to respond at this point, then we'll take council questions if there are any. Happy to, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> as the council will recall here not too long ago, this uh, subject in our uh, zoning ordinance has been um, discussed <clears throat> with council and reviewing the uh, kind of the urban agriculture concept. Um, and I know the council had some discussions, it was about two months ago on this. And at this current time, the way our zoning ordinance is structured is um, uh, having chickens on residential property of, of, the, of the size that Mr. Scallion lives on is prohibited at this time. Um, and I know there's been, we've had more than one inquiry about this um, from, from other residents in the past, but I wanna have uh, Doug Ollendike speak a little bit to what the prohibition is currently and then uh, follow up on the discussions that I know we're current, that staff is currently working on with the Planning and Zoning Commission related to the zoning ordinance. Doug? For more on that, I'm bringing Doug online. Good evening. Uh, as Matt indicated, the way that the city code is currently structured, there is a prohibition of uh, the grazing or the feeding of animals, livestock, uh, whether or not that is uh, horses or cattle, sheep, goats, swine, poultry, or other fowl um, on property that is less than five acres in size and in which the containment or the housing for the animals is within 150 feet of the home or 50 feet from an adjoining property. So as we have previously discussed, the uh, way that the code is written today, it generally prohibits uh, all livestock uh, types of animal keeping on traditional Clive residential property. Uh, there are a few exceptions, obviously, when you get out into some of the uh, uh, rural type properties that we have a few left. Uh, and also, as you're aware, uh, the city had the ability to do that uh, through the utilization of the city's green belt and park spaces. 
So at this particular time, uh, although we do get uh, an increasing number of inquiries and uh, increasing number of uh, citizen complaints regarding uh, the housing and feeding of agricultural animals, the current code does prohibit it. And we are in fact uh, required to enforce that code standard. Uh, so again, uh, certainly sympathetic to uh, the situation and the fact that they have been there for quite some time. However, this particular provision has been in the code for uh, many decades. Um, and at this particular point, the code enforcement officer is simply following through uh, based on the enforcement requirements of the code. Thank you, Doug. Um, I appreciate that uh, guidance and, and reminder of the ordinance. Council, are there questions or comments uh, for uh, for Carter at this point, or for Doug, or for Matt? Mr. Mayor. Michael, uh, go yeah, ahead. I, just a couple quick comments. Um, you know, I, I obviously we're, we're discussing this and there's been discussion for years. I think we need to do one one or the other, revisit it and, and see if we're going to pass something different. But in, at this time, it, it is an ordinance. And uh, I, I would have to guess that somebody called it in because we don't walk backyards and we don't proactively check backyards for chicken coops and chickens and other animals. So I'm, I'm thinking a neighbor would have called it in, which forced us to then enforce it. Is that right, Doug? Yes, correct. So that makes it a tough one, you know, when the neighbors are calling. But that's all. It, it, uh, it does. Thank you for that. Are there other uh, questions or comments, Council? I have one. Susan? I was interested to hear about quiet chickens. Could I hear what that um, type of chicken is again? I just hadn't heard of that before. Yeah, so my breed of chickens, um, they're called silky chickens. Um, I'm not sure, you may have seen them on like Facebook or something um, in a picture, but they're little fluffy chickens. So they're much smaller than um, the average chicken that you would eat or see. Um, they're actually not even um, meant for livestock. They're really just pets. Um, you can't actually raise them for meat or anything since they're so small. Um, but they're considered like the most docile breed of chickens. Um, so they don't make noise. They don't do the stereotypical cockadoodle do when you wake up. Um, they're just hens. And the only time that they'd ever make noise um, would be when I go out there during the day. Um, and still they're, um, the sound they make is very quiet. Um, and from what I understand, um, the complaint wasn't so much a complaint um, that we got. Um, we actually do have a neighbor that is moving out. Um, and as a way of saying goodbye, from what I understand, he decided he wanted to report it um, since we haven't had the best pass with those neighbors, but all of my other neighbors that live around me have had no complaints. And over the three years that I've had them and had him as a neighbor, um, he's never said anything to me about them, um, never complained about the noise. I've even offered to give them eggs before. Um, all my surrounding neighbors are aware of it and get eggs um, frequently, so I'm not really sure uh, what more to say about that. Susan, does that uh, th does that answer your question about quiet chickens? Yes, I think it's an interesting concept. So yeah. glad to know about it. Thank you, Councilor. Are there other questions or comments at this point? Yeah, one one quick one um, and. Uh, Mike asked the question I was going to ask as, as far as how it was initiated, and then Susan also brought up a good point about the the, the type of chicken. Matt, is this something that, that Mr. Scallon can take to the Board of Adjustments to, to look into a variance based off his specific situation? Because for us, I mean, it's going to be citywide, but the Board of Adjustments can deal with it on an individual s scenario basis. If I can weigh in, uh, this is yeah, Doug. With respect to that question, uh, the actual code provision that's uh, of interest in this case is not in the zoning ordinance. It is in the city code. Uh, so it's not under the purview of the Board of Adjustment. Uh, if it 
needs to be changed or amended, obviously that's at the pleasure of the city council. Okay, I see. Thanks, Doug. Well, uh, our council, are there other questions or comments at this point? Just one quick uh, clarification. Uh, if the chickens were kept inside in a garage or something, would that be acceptable within the code, within the uh, ordinance? Uh, no, uh, the, the structure of the requirement uh, generally prohibits the grazing or feeding um, on a specific size of property. So whether or not it is inside a garage or inside the house has no bearing on, on the provision itself. And how long does the homeowner typically have to come into compliance? In this particular case, uh, the letter was issued on June 23rd, and the request is to uh, have the matter resolved by July 10th. Okay, thank you, Doug. Okay, council, other questions? So, Carter, uh, you, uh, I want you to, if one thing can, can occur tonight is that um, I want you to know that the council has listened to your situation and I think have asked good questions uh, about this. And so if anything, um, I want you to, to know that you've been heard and the council has taken your, your matter seriously. That's always very important. Um, at this point, where the council is choosing to uphold the ordinance, uh, at this point, I'm going to ask you to work with our staff uh, on resolving the demands of the letter that you received, and, uh, and I wish you well. Thank you, Carter. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Are there, uh, we're still in citizens' presentation. Are there others to address the council on an item that is not on the agenda this evening? Mayor, this is Pete. Uh, let me take a moment to see if I see hands. As a reminder to folks, if you would like to speak, go ahead and click at the bottom of your screen on the participant tab, and a little pop-out window will show up, and there will be an icon that says raise hand that you can use to get my attention. You can also use the chat function. My name is Pete DeCook, and you can send me a note within the chat. Mayor, we do have a couple folks who are participating just by telephone. I want to check with them real quick because they aren't able to use the hand raising function. One moment, please. Uh, caller with that ends in 1439. Are you here to speak on a particular topic uh, for citizen presentation, something not on the agenda tonight? Um, we are here to talk about the uh, change in ordinance at 14986 Sheridan Circle. Thank you, that is on the agenda tonight, so we'll get to you in just a moment. One, uh, there's one, other, one other phone number I wanna check on, one more, Mayor. Caller ending with telephone number 3814. Are you here this evening to speak on an agenda item, an item that is not on the agenda? I am not, thank you. Thank you very much. Now with that, I do not see any other questions that are going uh, coming up for uh, citizen presentation. Okay, thank you, Pete. Seeing none, then we'll move um, now. We'll move back to consent items. Um, as indicated previously, we have set aside uh, four uh, items under consent items. Um, that was moved and seconded. Uh, and then we went back to, uh, to citizens presentation. So now at this point, I'm going to move back to the first item that's been set aside, which is item AE. This is involving a resolution approving change order number three for mainline construction incorporated Clark street phase one reconstruction project in the amount of $34,000. And I guess council, uh, or Jim, um, who wants to start? Your Please. Honor, this is this is Matt. Just one uh, one point of clarification in terms of order. Is it, if it's uh, all right with Your Honor, could we uh, have the vote on the the balance of the consent agenda, and then move into these four items uh, for those separate votes related to those four? Move the resolution approving the con the consent items. I second. 
It's moved by John, seconded by Eric. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, that, uh, those items pass, um, but for the record, uh, I believe we took a vote previously. I know, I know we stopped and then went back to citizens' presentation, but it was moved, seconded, and voted upon. That was approval of the agenda, Mayor. Okay, uh, we'll move ahead. Um, Item AE, uh, as spoken. Uh, Jim, if you'd uh, address it, please. Jim, this is Pete. You should be able to unmute yourself. Jim, are you on? One moment, Mayor. I've got. Participant Jim H. Listening to unmute. Hear me now. Jim, this is Pete. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Excellent. We can hear you, but very faintly. Can you speak up, please? Sure. Um, this item is for additional uh, water testing requirements over and above the student specifications to govern work on the project. Uh, the main difference that this is calling out is that the sample is obtained from a separate copper test board rather than a hydrant. Uh, we have had trouble getting tests to pass when the samples are taken directly from the hydrant. Um, this practice also ensures um, conformity of water testing on all project types within the city, whether it's residential, commercial, or a CIP project. Uh, I believe Council Member Klein, you had requested that this be discussed. Uh, do, you, uh, do you have questions? I don't, uh, Jim. Thanks for that explanation on that. Just want a little bit more clarification, Mayor, on on individual costs for that, and also uh, moving forward. Uh, just, I think Jim's clarified that that uh, this will be included in the bid process. Okay. And move approval. Second. It's moved by John, seconded by Eric. Further discussion? Uh, as a point of order, since we're still under consent items, um, will all those in favor say aye? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, that ad item passes five to zero. All right, we'll drop down to item AH. Uh, this is a resolution approving the amendment to ground lease and operation maintenance agreement for Metropolitan uh, Salt Storage Facility on Metro Waste Authority property. And Matt, if you would address that, please. Yes, Your Honor. Um, the, this item and the next one, I uh, want to just pull these from the consent agenda. Um, these are related to uh, the City of Des Moines has decided to um, remove their ownership of one of the buildings of the salt storage, uh, joint salt storage facility with uh, and Metro Waste Authority is the conduit for that uh, project. Uh, this will afford the city some additional space in the, in the leftover space. Um, would ask for a, a record vote on these two actions. That's all I have, Your Honor. Move approval of AH and AI. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Eric. Further discussion? Mr. Mayor, it's just uh, based on me abstaining. Uh, thank you, Council Member McCoy. Other discussion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, those abstain. items pass uh, four in favor with one abstention. Thank you. Okay, last set aside item here under uh, consent items is item AQ, and this is. Uh, uh, in order to accept a decision uh, and order for the Board of Adjustment, case number 20-1014-14986, Sheridan Circle. Doug, would you speak to this one, please? Uh, yes, uh, what's, what's before you is uh, the decision and order from the Board of Adjustment from their recent case on this property. 
Uh, typically, it's a receive and file of counsel. In this particular case, uh, it was an affirmative or a grant of the variance. Uh, the city code does allow for the city council to request that the Board of Adjustment reconsider uh, any affirmative granting of a variance. Uh, so in this particular case, if you uh, felt like there was an error in the process or the procedure, or if there was uh, new or, or outstanding information uh, that maybe wasn't part of the uh, uh, process or record of the Board of Adjustment, then there may be reason to uh, have the Board of Adjustment reconsider. Um, if you do do that, we will uh, take that back to the Board of Adjustment at their next meeting in July. We will follow the same publication and notice requirements of all property owners. We will place that on the Board of Adjustment's agenda. Uh, again, as you will recall, the Board of Adjustment is not compelled to reconsider, uh, but they will have to make a determination of whether or not they feel like uh, reconsideration of the motion from the previous meeting is worthwhile, or they may feel that they have uh, uh, had an appropriate record for that and then proceed back to the city council for, again, uh, uh, acceptance of their determination. So that's where you're at at this point. Uh, I believe you do have a couple of property owners, uh, both the applicants as well as uh, some uh, uh, property owners that are adjacent that have objected to the granting of the variance. And otherwise, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So Doug, if you would walk through the, and I know this is in the packet, but just for the the record walk through uh, the property setup, um, you know, uh, and, and really kind of the basis of the complaint and um, and staff's recommendation. If you just uh, reaffirm that, certainly. Uh, in this case, uh, the applicant uh, has a property that is uniquely configured in which three of the four sides of the property are front yards. Uh, so there are street frontage along three of the four sides of the property. Uh, in this case, the applicant desires to install a swimming pool in a rear yard. Uh, in this case, uh, the property does not have a rear yard. It has three front yards and a side yard. Uh, so by ordinance requirements, uh, they're not able to install a swimming pool as other properties within the city would be allowed to. Uh, in order to um, uh, get a permit to construct that swimming pool, the applicant uh, made a request to the Board of Adjustment to ask for a variance, in this case citing a unique condition for the property, um, and then uh, also further outlining the uh, spirit and intent the ordinance being consistent and that swimming pools are permissible and typical in residential properties. Uh, in this case, uh, as I said, the Board of Adjustment did uh, make a decision uh, to grant the variance. And in terms of a specific staff recommendation, um, as we put together the materials for the Board of Adjustment, staff is simply the facts and figures. Uh, we don't provide a specific recommendation to either approve or deny the variance request. Uh, that is the sole responsibility of the Board of Adjustment to determine uh, the appropriateness based on the requirements of the code. Council, are there questions for Doug? Maybe we could put up the map for everybody to see. One moment, Councilman. Thank you, Matt. John, did you have a question? No, just wanted the map so people would know, uh, have a point of reference. Sure, okay. Uh, Council, any questions or comments at this point? Doug, I drove by there today to take a look at that. Is it the side yard or the backyard that I, I don't recall. The uh, proposed swimming pool would be located in the uh, south portion of the property. So uh, what would be technically in terms of the front and the rear of the house, it would be at the rear of the house or in the uh, front view line of those homes that are on the south side of Sheridan. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> and is there some screening that needs to be put up there? I didn't see it in the BOA minutes. Uh, screening is not required. 
uh, for a swimming pool. Uh, there is a requirement to have a barrier, uh, i.e. a fence. So in this particular case, uh, the property, because of the sloping uh, topography in the rear of the yard, will have an elevated retaining wall with a fence on top of that uh, to protect the swimming pool. I believe so, the applicant had also indicated that, that again, just as their um, uh, personal interest of beautifying the yard and so forth, we're installing some landscaping uh, associated with the other site improvements. Thank you. Hey Doug, this is Eric. I just, I just want to make it clear to myself. So the applicant is installing required fencing and the applicant is also installing additional landscaping as screening device for the pool. Is that, is that, is that correct? Uh, yes, again, by the code requirement, a barrier is required. So the fence will be installed. And in this case, because of the topography, the fence will sit above uh, the natural lay of the land on top of the retaining wall, which is where the swimming pool will be located. Thank you. Other questions, Council? Okay, I believe we have uh, at least one or two uh, folks that are here to speak on this item. If you would uh, please advise Pete that you're here to speak and then we'll recognize you. Folks, again, if you use that hand raising um, function, click on at the bottom of your of your little Zoom screen. If you click on the participant icon, then a window will pop open, and you will be able to press the raise hand. You can also send me a text if you would like to speak. Now, I believe that the applicant is on on the call. Uh, good evening. Thank you for joining us. If you'd state your name and address for the record. Um, one moment, Mayor. Uh, uh, participant named Connie, is this the applicant for the? Yes. Uh, Connie and Al Voorhees, we are the applicants. Well, good evening. So uh, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, please share your thoughts and comments with the council. Um, well, I, I, I thought I had gone through the, the duly, um, the due process. Um, I understand that I have a neighbor or two that uh, probably isn't as excited about the prospect as I am, but I do have a unique lot. Um, I do have trees all along this, mature trees, 20 year old trees along the south side of the lot that provide the screening in addition to a fence. Um, the retaining wall is going to be a, a foot or two, so I don't want somebody to be thinking it's a four foot, six foot retaining wall and then a fence. It's a foot or two as it gently slopes. Um, any other house um, basically near uh, my neighbor that's most concerned wouldn't have to go through this process, and it's only because the city allowed a lot like this to be developed that I had to go through the process. Um, I want to point out that I understand 40 po postcards were sent out um, and I think we might have one or two um, on the call and a total of four, uh, one of which complained about the fence, which is within code. So I'm just going to sit back and trust that the, you know, we followed the process, the decision's been made, you're trusting your professional staff and um, I'll live with the decision you make. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Voorhees. Uh, appreciate that. Are there others then to speak on this item? Yes, Mayor, there is another uh, user named Cindy, if you would, please uh, unmute yourself. You Good, evening. Good evening, if you'd state your name and address for the record. Hello, this is uh, Cindy Badlow. Um, and I'm the one who's right smack going to look at this every morning my front yard. Okay, send me I wish I could, and I wish I could show you a video of it. If I could figure out how to do that, I would do that. Well, I can't show you. I started it, but it's not showing. So my understanding, and I, when I saw the plans, actually I saw the plans today because I couldn't find them online other than Connie did come over and, and share, share them with us. Um, but I did find one online and the, um, 
I understand that there's one other lot in in Clive that has a uh, some where somebody has a swimming pool. In in this case, in my front yard, which will be a fence and a swimming pool, ten yards across the street from me. So instead of my view of their beautiful trees, I'm not going to have a white fence and a swimming pool. And I understand people can do those in their backyards, but this, however, happens to be my front yard. Um, I already looked last night to see where on Zillow I can find another house to move to, but I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to remodel this house. I really don't want to move, but that's what we're looking at is because somebody wants to build a swimming pool in my front yard. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, Council, are there any questions? Any other additional questions at this point? I guess I have a question for Doug. Uh, we had several emails today uh, indicating that uh, there was more concern along Sheridan. Uh, do we have documentation for that? Are there more concerns uh, that we've heard in the last few days than what was communicated to the Board of Adjustment? I don't believe that um, I any of the specifics have really deviated from uh, what was presented either through written or, or verbal conversation through the process. Doug, this is Eric. A quick question for you. One of the concerns from the neighborhood was that the building of this pool would reduce property values. Is there data supporting that or any documentation or, or what's your thoughts on that? Uh, there was no documentation or supporting information provided by uh, any of those that made the comments. Um, in terms of my personal opinion, I'm I'm not a uh, an appraiser, um, so it's simply my opinion. And in this case, uh, swimming pools are a kind of natural component within a residential setting. Uh, they are located in rear yards. Uh, they also have fences. In this case, uh, again, you know, if this was simply a, a backyard situation, uh, they could run the fence uh, down to within 20 feet of the property line, whether or not there was a pool there or not. Uh, so now you're really just down to asking the question of does a swimming pool devalue an adjacent property? Um, I'm not aware of any, any uh, documentation or, or uh, studies that have concluded that. However, I have uh, certainly not provided any kind of uh, substantial effort in, in unearthing such a study if it, it does exist. Thank well, you. Let me, let me speak to that real quick. As a, as a realtor, um, I can tell you that if I walk into the house across the street from that and I'm doing a market analysis, um, I'm not devaluing the property value uh, because there's a, a pool across the street. Now, I'm not saying that it's the best view that, that they necessarily want, and I certainly understand the objection, um, but I'm just going to tell you from a professional realtor's perspective, it is not going to negatively impact market value. I know that's that's the real common, you know, quick response that is going to hit my value, but, um, but I, I don't believe that that's true, and I don't think that there's any, like Doug is saying, there's any data to, to back that up. Are there other council questions or comments at this point? I, I, I think we have some others to speak on this, but I wanna make sure we get the council questions and comments out there. Okay, seeing none, um, Pete, do we have others to speak then? Yes, we do, Mayor. I'm trying to find here John and Lee Luana, uh, and I know that you all are registered here as Cindy, working with one of Cindy's machines, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you both to unmute and then Uh, good evening. If you could state your name and address for the record, please. One moment, Mayor. They're still working on coming in. Hello. Uh, good yes, evening. Ma if you could state your name and address for the record, please. I'm uh, Dr. John Wana, and I live across the street to the south from uh, from from uh, from this place from this lot and uh, 
and we are the south. We are one four nine seven two Sheridan Avenue. We are just uh, uh, east of uh, Mr. Badaloo. Uh, listen, uh, twenty years ago, there was a proposal that Mr. Uh, Boris wanted to build a fence for his kids because they were little. They wanted a fence. And the uh, neighborhood objected to that. We went to the city council and we uh, appealed to them that this won't be right because it will decrease definitely the, the, the property values of our area here. It's unsightly and it's not right. And these kids well, were little, they wanted to play. Now the council at the time, 20 years ago, it was, they denied him the fence. Now, if you, uh, if I ask you guys, come and look at this lot. It is an elevated lot. And it's right in front of our house. It's a front yard for him and a front yard for me. How do we put a, front, a, a pool in a front yard? Usually pools are in the backyard. Fa the backyard will be facing the backyard of another house. It will not be in the front yard, right on the street. That does not sound at all right. It's unsightly. It decreases the property values here. And the, noise. and the noise from these people who are at the pool will also be uh, annoying. I mean, that is, you, you have to consider all the neighborhood here. These people wanted to do things opposed to what the neighborhood likes. And, and, that's, that's, and the vote was against them 20 years ago. I don't know, see why we should uh, allow it now. I really don't. Okay, sir, thank you for your comments. Um, are there others then to speak on this item? There, there are others to like, speak on this. I have some folks participating by telephone and I'm going to go ahead and unmute them. Caller at one four three, ending in 1439, could you please give us your name? Yes, so my name is Nick Heisdorfer. If you'd, hold on just a moment. If you'd be so kind to state your name and address for the record, please. Yes, I will. Can you hear me fine? I can. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nick Heisdorfer. My wife, Marcia Dorhout, is on the phone with me. We live at 15034 Sheridan Avenue, um, which is directly across from Alan Connie's house. And as I talk about this, I want everybody to understand that we think Al and Connie have been very nice neighbors and have no qualms with them, but their proposed pool, from what we understand, um, will be directly on our front dining room window. And also Connie did come over and talk to us about the fence and the landscaping that we'd be put in there. And it was my understanding that there would be one or two of her mature trees that would be removed. Now, we didn't receive our postcard informing us of this until after Connie had come over. Matter of fact, it just came to us this week. And though we're not necessarily opposed to pools at houses, um, the placement of a pool where Al and Connie are looking to put it is, in our opinions, out of place on the street that we live in. We do have pools behind us, as other residents have pointed out, um, and you know those are in other people's backyards and we do not have issues with them. But we do think the unfortunateness for Alan Connie is that their house is on a lot that has three relatively front yards and a protruding fence, pool or no pool, um, along that side of their house on Sheridan Avenue, not only doesn't fit into the neighborhood landscaping and how the rest of the neighborhood is laid out, but would not be appealing to us to look at every day at our, at our home. And we're, we will be stuck looking at that fence 
and that layout for 12 months out of a year. And even if for the heated pool, you could be talking three or four months of pool usage for them. Now we looked online to try to find the minutes of the last meeting to understand why this was approved. We were unable to see that. So that's why we would like to have this um, go back down to the Board of Adjustments to be reconsidered. Thank you for your comments and uh, uh, for your thoughts as well. Um, Peter, are there others to speak on this item? Yes, there may be. I have another caller here. I want to make sure to see if they're here to speak on this item. Caller whose number ends in 3814, are you here to speak on this item? I am not. Okay, thank you. Are there okay. others who would like to speak on this item? Um, I know Marty, you've been talking or helping with you through the chat here, identify folks. Uh, is this an item that you would like to speak on as well? If you would, would you please go ahead and raise your hand? <coughs> Mary, I do not see any hands that have gone up at this point. Okay. All right. So, uh, so Council, there's been discussion, I think, some very uh, good questions uh, uh, as well uh, regarding this item. Um, what is the, what's the desire of the council? Is the desire to accept the decision uh, or to remand it back to the Board of Adjustment? And I would remind um, everyone uh, that, uh, and I think it was stated earlier, that, uh, uh, that the council cannot overrule uh, the Board of Adjustment. They can send it back and request reconsideration. They're not required to reconsider it. No. And they could stick with their original ruling and um, that would be it. So uh, I just want to remind everybody of that. Pete, did no, you this have is, Yeah, I'm sorry, Mayor. It looks like Marty did want to get his hand in there. Uh, Marty, apologies. I you know technology slows us down a little bit here. You should be unmuted at this point if you'd like to speak. Marty, can you just, uh, we know who you are, but just state your name and address for the record, please. Hey. I am Marty Badlow. I live at 14992 Sheridan Avenue. I've been here about five, oh, get back, almost 10 years now. Okay, uh, thank you, let me speak. First, I wanna say six people voted on the variance. Two were in favor, four were opposed. I don't understand how that math works to approving a variance, but that's the first thing. The second thing is, if you look at the two people who supported the variance, they both acknowledge that Connie and Al Voorhees are very nice people. And I want to note, if you look at the map, they are live on 151st Street north across Sher Sheridan Circle and north of the pool. They are not going to be affected by a pool that goes in a house that far away. They aren't going to see it. They aren't going to hear it. The people who are opposed, three of the people who are opposed, opposed are right here on Sheridan Avenue. Nick and Marcia, John and Leila Wana, and uh, Tom and Mary, I miss Merkel. I've also spoken to Janet Nelson at 15064. John Wana is at 14972. He did not get the postcard, did not send anything in. So you have one, two, three, four, you have five people on Sheridan Avenue all going to be looking at this pool. It's a five against two type of situation. That's one reason why I'd like to see the process be moved back to the uh, Board of Adjustments to review. This, and also I'd like them to, on a technical standpoint, like them to do a better job or make it easier for us to see the minutes and see the results and have easier, easier to have, for us to have access to the meeting. My neighbors, the one is, uh, when they said they told them it was a Zoom meeting, they said, I don't know what a Zoom meeting is. So I'm here to help them. But anyway, you've got, now have six people, maybe more who are opposed to the project because we will be living with it every day. The, uh, the Board of Adjustments said that this was a hardship to the Voorhees by not being able to build a pool or use their, their pool to the, to the fullest. Well, they bought that corner lot knowing there were certain restrictions on there to begin with 20 years ago. 
Uh, another thing is, I don't know that not having a pool, I don't see how the lack of a pool is a hardship for anybody. There's a lot of things that qualify as a hardship. Not ha having a pool doesn't really make it, in my opinion. The next thing is, I'm concerned about the noise. This project is going to be 30 feet or just 10 yards, one first down from our property. The only time a pool is quiet is when it's not being used. I was a kid, I've got grandkids. We have people in our back, mirrors behind us that all have pools. They get very loud. So the assurance that this pool will not be loud just can't be made. So those are, those are the reasons why I would like, I, I need some peace and quiet. I can't sit on my back deck without listening to neighbors, uh, other people in their pools. If I go in the front, yard, front porch, just order some new Adirondack chairs to sit there and, and read and enjoy the summer, I don't want to have to be listening to more noise on both sides of my house. So I'm concerned about, from a public interest standpoint and from a neighborhood integrity, our whole street is going to be affected adversely by a house on Sheridan Circle. Thank you. Right, thank, thanks for your comments. And I, I just want to clarify one thing, um, just so there's no confusion. The actual Board of Adjustment vote was three in favor, two opposed. Um, you, you've indicated the, that a number of your neighbors have voiced opposition to the project versus the number that have voiced uh, support of the project. I just want to, for the record, uh, delineate that so nobody else is confused by it. Um, Mayor, okay. Mayor, thank, you, Mayor thank you for your clarification. Uh, yes, I, I just would have thought that with more neighbors opposed to the project than those supporting the project might also influence the, uh, the Board of Adjustment who voted 3-2 in favor of the variance. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, Council, we... Um, uh, we're, we're back now to uh, to the desire of the council uh, based on what you've heard, based on um, Board of Adjustment recommendation, staff discussion, uh, hearing from the neighbors and from the uh, the applicant. Uh, what is the desire of the council? Mayor, this is Pete. The applicant, Connie, uh, did raise her hand again if you would like to recognize her or if you'd like to move forward, council. Uh, Connie, go ahead, please. One moment. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. I, it's too bad that people didn't receive postcards, but um, there have been two large signs in my yard for two weeks, three weeks, maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, so it's not like people couldn't have been curious about that. Um, the WANAs didn't react. Um, both of the other two people on the call did send a letter and was considered by the board. So when you say four people are against and two or four, you're forgetting the 34 other people who didn't take the time to say, we don't have a problem with this. So again, I just hope the city um, falls back to the professionals and the, the process and the people they've put in place. Thank you. Thank you, Connie, for, uh, for your additional thoughts as well. Council, your desire? Mr. Mayor, this one uh, quick clarification from Doug, if we could. Uh, Doug, am I correct that we heard from additional residents tonight concerning their opposition, particularly the homeowner at 14972? Is that correct? I believe that there was uh, some additional comment provided that was uh, not provided during the Board of Adjustment meeting, yes. Well, with that in mind, uh, perhaps it would be appropriate to ask the uh, board to look at the additional comments and feedback uh, that we've had. This meeting is being recorded. Um, and so I would move that we remand it to the Board of Adjustment for a further review in light of the additional uh, comments we've received. I'll second. It's moved by John, seconded by Ted to remand back to the Board of Adjustment for reconsideration. Is there further discussion by the council? Yes, this is Eric. I, I would add a comment that although we did have one additional comment today, um, I have confidence 
in our board of adjustment and, and the votes that they take. Uh, I also want to say that I too have, have taken a look at this property right there and I can certainly understand the concerns from uh, Mr. Badalou and, and the other editors right there. I think uh, one thing that, that is important to understand is, is I looked at this and read through the material that the main trees will all stay there. The only tree that's going to come down is uh, one that's very close to the property but the main trees that act as a barrier will all stay there. In addition, it, it looks like additional shrubbery is going to be put up as a barrier, along with a, a brand new fence right there. So from my perspective, I think they've done their due diligence, due diligence with this particular matter right here. I certainly understand uh, the concerns from, from the neighbors uh, that will have a different look out their front window. Change is difficult, uh, I, I get that but I am comfortable with, with that decision, the Board of Adjustments. Thank you, Council Member Klein, for your uh, discussion item. Is there further discussion on this item that's been moved and seconded? Your Honor, I do have a comment, and um, I am ready to vote to um, support the Board of Adjustments uh, recommendation here, but want to let people know that I've been through this personally, our next door neighbors, um, proposed and eventually installed a pool and I was very concerned about it because it is in an area that had potential to block our view of the lake that is behind our home and I'm just so pleased that the owners ended up being um, very careful to do some nice landscaping. They installed a wrought iron fence instead of a fence that would have blocked things off completely. Um, they are appropriate in terms of noise and that kind of thing. So I have found that it very likely adds to the value of both their property and ours. So there are ways to um, have something that seems to be a concern turn out really well for everyone. So I would like to have everyone keep an open mind. Thank you, Council Member Judkins. Uh, other comments before I ask the council to vote? So Mayor, I'll just make a quick comment. I, um, I mean, I agree with pretty much what everyone's saying here. I, 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 again, understand everyone's concerns. I also have spoken to a couple of residents who aren't on this call who have concerns about this and um, you know, I think both sides have valid points, um, other than the whole market value discussion that we talked about earlier, I, I don't believe that there's any impact to, to the market value of your home. Um, but, um, I, I it, it does sound like to me that there's some objections and some information that maybe the Board of Adjustments didn't have during their initial deliberation. And so that's why I would support uh, remanding this back to them uh, to, for them to make the, the appropriate decision. Thank you, Council Member Weaver. Others before I ask the Council to vote. Seeing none, again, it's been moved and seconded to remand back to, uh, back to the Board of Adjustment for reconsideration. Will the Council please vote? Your Honor, I apologize. I've lost my document. It must have timed out. Could I vote um, verbally? Uh, yeah, uh, please. Matthew, um, please no. Yes, I would vote no. Mayor, it doesn't seem to be updating, but the vote is two against, three in favor. 
So item passes uh, three in favor to two to remand back to uh, the Board of Adjustment. Um, staff, you have your direction from the council. Uh, neighbors, thank you for being on the call with us and for sharing with us. And um, I, again, as I said in a case before, it's important that anyone that comes before us understands that they've been heard. And I think heard uh, diligently and thoughtfully. And um, I hope you can rest with that at this point. I thank you and uh, thank you for attending. Okay, next item is action items. Uh, this first item is a public hearing regarding the vacation of the storm uh, sewer easement at Walnut Creek Hills and Clyde, Platte 2, uh, Lot 67, and Lot 68. And Matthew, did we uh, post appropriate public notice? Uh, yes, Your Honor, we did. That was published in the Des Moines Register on June 8th, 2020. Thank you, Matthew. Jim. Jim, this is Pete. You should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you, Mayor. Jim, could you please speak up too, please? Sure. Last year's project on Meredith Drive included the construction of a new storm sewer system and the subsequent removal of an existing culvert under the old roadway and across a portion of lots 67 and 68 in Walnut Creek Hills of Clyde Plateau. Um, as a result, the permanent easement associated with that culvert is no longer needed. Staff would recommend vacating the easement at this time. Thank you, Jim. Uh, council, questions? Move the resolution. Close the public hearing if there are no questions. Second. Uh, Moved by John to close the public hearing, seconded by Eric. Uh, before we do, is there anybody here to speak on this item? No, I do not see any hands up. Seeing none, will the council please vote? Your Honor, I'm going to have to vote my voice again. I think because I'm an admin, I'm not able to control what my projection like I should, and I can't get to the document, which is behind the projection. Uh, uh, Councilwoman, you might be able to use your alt tab function and then use your arrow keys to go to your other screen. Usually uh, I'm able to shrink down and I just, I'm not able to do it. One moment. I've done this multiple times and never had the problem before. <clears throat> well, we can, uh, we can verbally take your vote. No problem. Yeah, the only other thing I know to do is to leave and come back, which I'd rather not do. So um, I, I will vote yes. Passes five to zero to close the public hearing. Move the resolution. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Eric. Further discussion? Saying now, will the council please vote? I'll vote yes. Noted. And that passes five to zero. Thank you, Jim. Okay, the next item is a consideration of proposed ordinance number 1093, amending Title I, Chapter 9A. City Clerk, Joyce. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this ordinance amending the City Clerk and then the subsequent one for amending the City Treasurer will um, these changes were just a result of the phase one reorganization we did of our department last fall. So now these ordinances will match up with the job descriptions for the city clerk and the city treasurer. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Questions, council? I'd move that the rule 
requiring three readings be suspended with regard to ordinance number 1093. Second. Okay. Moved by John, seconded by Eric to suspend the rules. Any discussion? Seeing none, will the council please vote? I'll vote yes. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, can I just say how impressed I am that John Edwards has that language? <laughs> and I had it ready and everything, and he just that is rather impressive. Yes, I thought I thought McCoy would have it. I did. I was ready to roll, but John is fast. He's fast. That passes five to zero to suspend the rules. Well, McCoy, take it away then. Put him on the spot. We're waiting. Uh, I was muted and I just read it all and I was muted. Move that, uh, that ordinance number 1093 be considered, placed upon its passage and adopted. Second. second. Moved by uh, Michael, seconded by Eric. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the council please vote? I'll vote yes. Thank you, Susan. This is high pressure. And that passes five to zero. Thank you, Joyce. And we'll just keep you right here for the next one. Item yes. number three, which is consideration of proposed ordinance number 1094, amending title one, chapter nine B, city treasurer. Joyce, take it away. Yes, so this one is the same scenario as the last one. Initially, the city treasurer duties were with the city clerk's position. So when we did our, um, our changes last fall, now those will, the city treasurer duties will fall under my job description. So those changes just are amended to reflect that. And I'm, again, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Move that the rule requiring that an ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to this meeting be suspended with respect to ordinance number 1094. Second. John? Who seconded that? John. John? Okay, moved by Michael, seconded by John. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the council please vote? I'll vote yes. Thank you. There is zero chance that McCoy has that memorized. <laughs> <laughs> Got it written on my palm right now. That passes five to zero to suspend the rules. Mr. Mayor, you got to keep decorum going here with Weaver in there. Move that well, ordinance number 1094 be considered placed upon its passage and adopted. Second. Moved by Michael, seconded by John. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the council please vote? I'll vote yes. Item passes five to zero. Uh, let the record reflect that ordinance number 1094 has been enacted. Okay, we'll move to item number four, and this is a consideration of proposed ordinance number 1095, amending provisions pertaining to jumping off uh, of bridges in public right of ways or on the public property. Uh, Matt, would you take this please? Thank you, Your Honor. I'll start off uh, discussion tonight on this item. Uh, as the council directed at your last meeting, um, the city attorney has prepared an ordinance amendment for your consideration that would ban the jumping, climbing, and loitering uh, upon uh, bridges and on public property in the city of Clive. This is in response to concerns that have been shared with both uh, council and staff uh, related to the bridge jumping that is, uh, has been occurring on the Campbell Park Bridge uh, along the Greenbelt Trail system. And uh, so uh, within the packet, we included, an, uh, uh, City Attorney included a memo kind of describing the ordinance changes that are uh, being proposed uh, and then the different uh, enforcement mechanisms that are uh, included within that ordinance. And then also I noted in the, um, the memo uh, within the packet, um, Pending your direction tonight, uh, waiving, uh, if you choose to waive the rules and proceed to third reading and final reading of this ordinance, 
um, that we, uh, both the police department would initiate enforcement as soon as this ordinance goes into effect, which is uh, based on the publication date, which would likely be about the middle of next week, based on when it's uh, published in the, in the newspaper. Uh, the Leisure Services Department has been working on signage to be installed. And if you've been in that area, and unfortunately I thought I had a picture and I can't find it um, uh, recently, the Parks Department, Parks Division has been uh, going in that area and clearing out um, some, uh, some of the green space along the stream bed um, away from the bridge uh, to kind of encourage the, the kids that are congregating there to get away from the bridge um, and have another space. I know that was a request of the council um, at the last meeting. In fact, I, I took a bike ride myself in the area a couple nights ago and they were utilizing that area uh, down there uh, to access the water, which was, which was good to see. I know that was a, a, an item that the council wanted to see as well. And then also uh, we've uh, been developing a communication strategy um, to use both the city's mediums and get some media coverage to if, if the council were to put this prohibition in place to make sure we're getting that communicated. I also would note that the police department intends for about that first week uh, of the enforcement to, um, to, have, to issue warnings initially, uh, but, um, to give uh, the kids a chance to adjust to the, to the new regulations if they're approved here tonight uh, before issuing any formal citations. So with that, Your Honor, I'd be happy to answer any questions or any uh, comments council may have regarding this item and staff would recommend waiving the readings three readings and moving to approval. Thank you, Matt. Questions, Council? Yeah, I got two questions. Um, so Matt, when we talk about warnings, I, obviously I, I agree with that approach. Are, does that mean we're taking names and addresses or are we, how, how does that work logistically? I'll let, I'll let the chief speak to it uh, specifically, but my uh, chief, you wanna sure. answer that? Yes. Um, generally what we do in a situation where there's just a, a warning and no police report, uh, we would make a notation on the, uh, what we call the CAD, the community to dispatch, uh, things that you've seen before where I've provided comments from previous calls. Uh, the officers will have body cams, so we'll be able to see who we've talked to and, uh, note names, uh, that, uh, that we've dealt with previously. And uh, then after uh, a week, we will uh, start issuing uh, citations based on, on this new ordinance if it's voted into effect tonight. So chief, help, help me with this. So first week we're given warnings, but um, so I, I guess where I'm, I'm wondering is, you know, are, if we're, are we taking a name so that we know that we've given them a warning and then the next time they they're automatically cited or do they, you know, even after a week, if, if it's the first time that we're dealing with a kid, are we, are we automatically citing them or what is your thoughts on that? Well, my intention after that first week, since uh, word is going to travel pretty quickly, we're going to publicize this on social media and our website. Uh, parks will be uh, putting signs out. there will be clear, warnings out there that things have changed. Uh, my intention would be to start issuing some citations in that second week. However, I do not take away discretion from my officers. If they feel there's a good reason not to issue a citation, that is certainly within their, uh, their discretion to do so. But uh, I guess the short answer would be after a week, I would imagine most contacts are going to uh, and in citations, uh, that is gonna be the quickest way for us to, to wrap up this problem. It's a problem we've been dealing with for a long time. And uh, um, I, I think that will help us get to a successful conclusion. Okay, fair enough. And then um, second question, uh, maybe for Christina, in your memo, we talk about a maximum up to certain numbers. I mean, what are we looking at for these first initial citations. I'm assuming we're not going straight to the max. No, I'm glad that you'd asked this question. The way that the enforcement mechanism has been um, you know, uh, drafted here, it gives the police um, 
uh, and right, the field officers a lot of discretion on escalating um, penalties, right? Starting with warnings and then moving to um, a scheduled violation, like a trespass violation under the state code, which is about $250, moving then to possibly this um, misdemeanor level or a civil infraction level, which does, again, have a penalty up to $500. That's actually at the discretion of the court. Our prosecutor makes a recommendation, but the judge issues um, that decision on the penalty itself. So what you're seeing here is a lot of flexibility in, um, in discretion to our officers to, to control the problem right at the lowest possible level that they can, um, but giving also tools for repeat offenders, so to speak. No, and that's good. That's per I, I appreciate that. And that's the way I think it should be. Um, I guess one question I had was what, what would merit a misdemeanor as opposed to a civil infraction or civil fine? I, 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 I can answer that if you, if you like. The, uh, the scheduled uh, violations, uh, state code does allow for certain violations that we can have a, a scheduled fine, which the lowest level for, for a, uh, what we would call a, a trespass would be a $200 fine plus court costs for a first offense. And then it goes up from there. I believe it's 250 and, and 300 if, I, if, I, uh, if I'm correct. Um, most of the time we would rather issue that citation, a scheduled violation, because if it were a juvenile and we, we issued the, the simple misdemeanor uh, where we would have a must appear, they're going to have to go to the juvenile justice system. And uh, right at this time, all of our uh, courts are quite backlogged because of uh, the weight on uh, COVID-19 restrictions. So the police would prefer uh, to issue a uh, citation with a, a scheduled monetary fine. So if the uh, the offender or their parent chooses to, they can pay the citation. They can also choose to appear in court if they want to. Uh, but if we went that, um, uh, that simple misdemeanor route, it would be a must appear and they would have to appear in juvenile court. We would like to prevent that if we can. Yeah, and no, I appreciate that, Chief. Uh, I mean, I don't think that's our intent is to try to, you know, hit these kids with, with any type of long-term um, you know, misdemeanor charges, it, it, you know, that would be a last resort for the most egregious behavior, right? So. Yeah, I do want to make it clear, though, that a trespass versus, a, um, you know, citing a simple misdemeanor for violation of our code, they're both still criminal violations that will be on a record, you know, so to speak. A civil infraction is one of those that's, again, civil, um, more like, you know, a violation for not cutting your grass or um, a code ordinance violation. So, you know, make no mistake, this is a criminal and illegal activity. Right. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Other hey, questions, Council? Yes, yeah, so this is Eric. I, I like the idea of, you know, we cleaned out the grass down there for an area to access the water of the creek. On these, the, the Clyde Greenbelt Master Plan, we talk about a flat water pool right there with some stream bank stabilization efforts. We have a timeline on that where you know, this can go into effect to, to give them uh, more of an alternative than climbing on the bridge and jumping there. I'd be happy to, to answer that, Your Honor, and I'll bring this uh, image up real quick that's in, the, in your packet. Give me a moment. So the uh, the Greenbelt Master Plan, the, the Greenbelt Triad projects, uh, the three main projects being the Greenbelt Landing, Porter Shelter, and then uh, the Campbell Bridge project, as you see on your screen, where we are we are bringing a water access component, more formalized water access component here, where it would be at the water's edge with the riffle zone underneath uh, underneath the bridge. The bridge would actually be reorientated in this hole. Uh, project and actually uh, widened um, in terms of providing more room for the creek to flow underneath it. Um, out of the three triad projects, this is the, the the last one of the three that's anticipated based on our current schedule right now. So uh, I would say best guess you're looking at a five-year time frame 
uh, just pending on funding is going to be the biggest key. Uh, as we know, um, under the current kind of pandemic environment, um, some of the fundraising and grant writing uh, work that we've been doing for Greenbelt Landing as the first project is going to be slowed here for a little while. So that'll kind of push push things back um, depending on outside funding opportunities, but which we identified as a major component of all three triad projects. But based on what we know today, it was on about the tail end of the five-year CIP. And so that either may be five year, five year, six, depending on funding levels. So Matt, just to be clear though, what, what you're suggesting the crew is doing now by making, doing some clearing down there is not this. Correct. Correct. This is this is the more the formal expectations of the council here. Yes, this is this is the formal construction project. The clearing that's been done in the area is really we view as an interim step to provide uh, that additional gathering green space for access to the water until we're able to do this more formalized project. Other questions, Council? Councilman McCoy has a question. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, may I get a uh, clarification on the the penalty, the civil infraction, misdemeanor. I heard civil citation. Um, can you explain that? Our options again. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I guess what we have discussed within the the police department team and my prosecution team is really four levels. So the, the ordinance has been drafted in a way to allow um, all four of these um, sort of levels to be, to be used or, or remedies to be used. One, the warning process. Number two, a scheduled fine. Uh, Chief, correct me, I think that's $250 on this one for trespass under the state code. Okay. I, I thought it was 200 plus costs, but uh, it's somewhere in there. That's probably right. I guess I rounded it. Um, three, um, a, a misdemeanor charge again, which is a, a violation up to $500. That's at the discretion of the court. And our prosecutor can recommend anywhere from, you know, $10 to $500. It's the court's decision on the fine for the misdemeanor um, violation under our city code. And then finally, the civil infraction, which is kind of this alternative um, to a criminal violation. Uh, a civil infraction is punishable with a civil citation uh, at $750 for the first violation. And then a second violation is, I think it's $1,000 or $1,200. So, thanks. Um, it helped me write them out. You know, it's, I don't think any of us, our intentions were to give an individual a scheduled fine sounds like that's a trespassing on the record misdemeanor on the record the civil infraction is as you explained the mowing of the grass or you know shoveling your snow or something like that it, it's interesting though that the scheduled fine of trespassing is 200 but our civil infraction which you know, wouldn't go on their record per se. Is that correct? The civil infraction doesn't go on yes. their, you know, they're, they're applying for college or military um, or whatever. I mean, that's correct. It would be a lawsuit if they challenged. Uh, it, it's actually a lawsuit though. So um, it would come up, you know, for example, in a title search or, I mean, again, Neither this is either criminal behavior uh, or punishable behavior, or it's not. Um, ideally, we don't um, have disagree. to use any of this. Yeah, I, I disagree that it's either criminal or not. I mean, we're talking ma mainly kids here, and I do agree with the chief that it will, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna curb it quick. Uh, I think the warnings alone will curb it quick. Um, I do agree with giving the the police department. The ability to ramp it up though right you've got one uh, somebody with the wrong attitude or you know that keeps pushing their luck on it and continues to do it and then I do think you need to allow the police to use their discretion on which of these four you use but but I I 
unless it goes to that level and again chief i guess i'm speaking to you more than anything and i trust you'll do it is that i wish we had a system that you could track the warnings because to ted's point i'd like to see if you know uh, mark smith was the one that was doing it you know two three times and then they get a warning but to go you know next week to give tickets well those kids weren't even out last week suddenly they're getting tickets right and then to put a misdemeanor on them for doing it once right on the second week it's on their record those things matter today in a competitive world of you know whether it be college or jobs or anything like that and they're I know it's not, it, it, can, it can end up in not so innocent, but gosh, we've been battling this one of letting them and not letting them to suddenly having it on their permanent uh, criminal record. Uh, I mean, there are some aspects with respect to the juvenile system. Um, this is not gonna be a juvenile violation. I would submit to you that, um, you know, there's a lot of risk here as we saw in that lawsuit with the city of Sioux Falls. Um, there's a lot of really good points to weigh, um, and it's not an easy decision I respect for any of you. But I, but we can make it illegal without, you know, I mean, the scheduled fine is $200, Mr. Mayor, and the civil infraction is 700 What we're saying is, do you want it on your record? We'll charge you 200 If you don't want it on your record, we'll charge you 700 and to me, that well, Michael, that was going to be my question, uh, actually, uh, was uh, the, is the, the minimum civil infraction set by code, by state code? That's correct, Your Honor. So we couldn't reduce, we couldn't have a lower than 250 or 750, it's, is, is it 750, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, so we couldn't reduce, we couldn't have a lower civil infraction level of 250, for example because of state code, is that right? You know, I actually would need to research that um, as I'm thinking about our red light civil infraction, infraction policy. We did have a different um, fine schedule for that. I would have to research that and get back to the council. Or mowing my lawn is $750 or not doing That's my correct. snow. Is, wow. Yeah, you better mow your, mow your lawn, McCoy. Yes, I well, got for goats. our the I chicken coop, you know, the chicken issue earlier this evening, that's a civil infraction consideration, for example. I think the point is, Mike's I exactly. The, hold on, Mike. everybody, if I may, just quickly. Um, this is a great discussion, and I think that uh, first and foremost, we want to stop the behavior because we know that it's dangerous. I think the council's intentions are clear there um, and very supportive of that. Uh, so we need to stop the behavior. I think that um, maybe we also need to have a better understanding of, of what our fine structures could be going forward um, with the discussion that we've had. And Matt, Christina, I don't know if we're in a position to move forward with passing this ordinance. Um, let's have the department issue warnings uh, until we're comfortable with a fine structure that makes sense based on what we're dealing with here. It, 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 can that be an option for us? Uh, Your Honor, I don't believe that the department, the police department has a basis right now to issue warnings except to say this is very dangerous behavior. Um, the council would have an option to move forward and pass the ordinance just on a first reading and we could come back with um, revised penalty provisions, amending essentially um, the penalty reference, uh, maybe for the second reading for the council on the next meeting. Well, that's what I'm suggesting. I also know that there's a, uh, there's a suggestion potentially to suspend the rules on this as well this evening. So I, I wanna get us to the, the best outcome the most quickly so that we can stop the behavior and empower our police department to do that. So how best do we do that? Your Honor, I... For clarification quickly, is from the chief, is there a way we can track the warnings? Look, I don't have a problem if it's just being caught up in me. I think Weaver has something to say, but it's that if, you know, we give somebody a warning and they're doing it again, hit them with a ticket. I'm fine with that. 
but it's just that we hit them with the ticket the first time because it happened to be the second week. That's where I have a problem. Yeah, I'm 100% in agreement. That That's kind of what I've been kind of talking about for a couple of weeks now. Can we collect names and addresses of these kids and, you know, let's warn them the first time. And then if they do it again, just like I said, I, I got no problem with it. But just, you know, one week of warnings, I just don't know if that's enough because, yeah, I mean, if they didn't get the word and then in, in 10 days they're out there and then now now they're on their permanent record. No, that's not our intent, right? We're not trying to criminalize these kids and, and, and hurt their future. That's not what we're trying to do here. So I just want to find the right balance. I think that's clear. And to my question, uh, what's the best, Madam Council, what's the best way for us to get there uh, the most expeditiously so that we can uh, that we can alter the behavior stop the behavior uh, chief also with your comment as well your honor and council very good discussion appreciate the intent here um i think the best recommendation we could make at this time is to suggest moving forward with just a first reading we will review the preemption issue or possible um whether or not we can alter the civil infraction um penalty, you know, um, value by the next meeting and have that for you. Because I think what that does is sends a message to start the communication that this is a concern of the council. You're taking proactive steps to address an issue that might be dangerous, you know, that's dangerous. Um, it demonstrates um, a proactive step without actually committing fully to the end state, if that makes sense. Well, if I could interject here, uh, it seems to me time is of the essence. Could we not pass the ordinance, get the signs up, and then if you de we determine uh, that there's a better schedule of fines, uh, we can amend the ordinance at that point. I mean, I'm concerned that there's a risk. I mean, I think we've been lucky that no one's been injured or, or killed at this point. So I guess I, I would want to explore the opportunity of going ahead and move forward, suspending the rules. And I think uh, we can give our officers great latitude, and I want the chief to speak to this, that if he would be comfortable once the uh, ordinance is enacted, if we pass it tonight, direct his officers to give uh, warnings at least for the first uh, period of time until legal counsel comes back with a recommendation on the fines. So we give warnings until we can revise the fine policy. Uh, yes, we certainly can give warnings, but if repeat violators are out there and they get another warning, the warnings tend to lose any meanings. I would prefer to have, before we start enforcement, I would prefer to have clear direction. That is all I've ever wanted on this issue, to be able to give my officers clear direction on what to do. So I, I believe we either need to, to have an ordinance for us to start with or uh, we can slow down and we can keep going the way we have been going. Well, I think that, so Chief, let me, let me interject here. Uh, we can deal with this. Um, I think, I think John's, John's proposal is a good one. Let's pass the ordinance as it's before us. Give your officers a couple of weeks to warn with the education that um, it could be 750 bucks next time, um, knowing that we're going to come back with um, potentially an amended schedule of fines as it relates to this. Um, you know, uh, so I, I think that we can accomplish what everybody wants to accomplish here. We may be a week off. A little bit one way or the other. Um, Christina may come back and we may not have options on on the civil infraction. Uh, so I think we need to be prepared for that. But um, I also think that we have to, to um, understand and appreciate the direction of the council on this issue. And that is to get this behavior stopped. We don't want to hurt kids. We don't want to put things on their record. Uh, and I understand, Chief, you got to have some teeth when you go out there. Um, but, uh, but we need to move forward and, um, 
So I, I happen to be in favor of John's suggestion uh, and Christina get back to us as quickly as possible. And um, maybe uh, chief that'll fall within a, re a reasonable period of time for your officers to be able to educate that this is changing and that it, it that, you know, we have passed an ordinance right now you get a warning and it's in play until we make the change on the schedule of fines. I think that's doable. I think we can manage it. And as you said, Chief, uh, you know, we're, you're, you're tracking the warnings on your CAD system. And I think that it's clear that the council uh, really, really wants that to occur. Um, and you're doing it already. So um, anyway, I'll stop there. Um, we really need to move this forward and establish direction for our department. Mr. Mayor, Your Honor, I'll, I'll add that I, I um, appreciate Council Members Edwards' um, recommendation and actually like that better than mine. Mr. McCoy? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I would support waiving the rule. Uh, as the Chief said, he needs a clear direction. And, and I think the clear direction then, if, that's, if it has to be a clear direction, is hopefully we don't have to amend the motion, but it's that you do track the warnings and in the second violation, the, 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 the person gets the, 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 the citation. And so uh, you have to track the first one and the first one, everyone gets a warning. Um, and if that's what we all agree on, I'm fine with waiving the third and going tonight. It's just, we have to track it. We can't just be uh, one week and then we're off or two weeks and then it's all, all on. So I'm very supportive. As long as we're going to track that first one, then we can get tickets. And I just speak to that, that I don't think that is really necessary that we set up a big tracking system. I think it challenges people to try to get away with it until they get their first warning. So I you're just going to hit them with a $750 fine. Yep. Be, we're that <laughs> serious about it. Now, I'm fine with, you know, having that be a little lower eventually, but I am that serious about needing to have it be clear to our police department and to the um, kids who've been kind of getting away with it for a lot longer than any of us have intended when we first talked about it. So... I haven't been getting away with it. We've allowed it. Well, it really wasn't what we'd agreed to. Uh, I, I want to come back to a, a critical point here, Chief, and just answer one more time, because I think I heard you say it, and that is these warnings are tracked in your CAD system already. Is that correct? That's yeah, if we can get names. You, you have to realize, though, when we go down and there's a group of 10 to 15 kids and we start to give warnings and people scatter, yeah. We're not always going to have people's names and we're going to come back later and there'll be a group of people who have been previously warned and there will be new people, but we will have appropriate signage there. It's not going to be a surprise to anyone. Um, I, and any uh, tickets that any officers write, there is no traffic ticket where we've ever required that an officer give a warning first before they write them a ticket the next time for a traffic violation. And it, it causes difficulties for this. I really feel that the best way to go about this is to give a, a first week's warning. There's appropriate signage. The people who are there after the first week are gonna know that they're doing something illegal. It's kind of like the people who climb over the fence and jump into our city pools when the pools are open. They get a citation for criminal trespass. It's a criminal violation, but all they did was go jump in the pool. They didn't hurt anything. But this is uh, very similar to that in, in my view. No, oh, no, 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 that's, that's a fenced in area. That's entirely different, but we do it on our snow ordinance as well. Uh, Mr. We'll go on. I, I won't be making the motion, so if someone else wants to. Well, what's the desire of the council? I would move that the rule requiring that an ordinance be considered at two council meetings be suspended with regards to ordinance number 1095. Second. It's moved by John, seconded by Eric to suspend the rules. Any further discussion? Mayor, one moment. I think Councilman Weaver has lost his audio. One moment. 
and that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I meant he was muted, not that he couldn't hear you, Councilman. Oh, no. okay. I apologize. I didn't mean to mislead you there. Councilman Weaver, can you hear us again? Or oh, sorry. One moment, Mayor. All right, can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you now, Councilman. Sorry about that. I couldn't unmute myself there. Ed, it's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. Yeah, I, 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 I vote yes. Okay, uh, seeing no further discussion, will the council please vote? To suspend vote the yes. Susan, did I hear you say yes? Yes, you did. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, passes four in favor with uh, four to one. To suspend the rules. Move that ordinance number 1095 be placed upon its passage and adopted. Second. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Susan. Uh, further discussion? Saying no, will the council please vote? Yes. Yeah. Item passes five to zero. Let the record reflect that uh, ordinance number 1095 is declared to have been enacted. Thank you, council chief. Madam Council, for your work there. We're going to move to item number five, which is a resolution approving professional services agreement with HDR Engineering for Clive Water Resources Master Plan in the amount of $249,962. Pete. Thank you, Your Honor. So tonight we have uh, Stephanie Fleckenstein and Andy McCoy from HDR Engineering. They are the recommended firm for this project, a very important project. It will weave together a lot of excellent knowledge and best practices that the city has developed over many years. Uh, council will recall from not only the memo, but last year this time during strategic planning, uh, coming up with a water resources master plan was one of our top strategic priorities for the city so that we could bring together not just information about the stormwater utility and our gray infrastructure, but also more and more uh, knowledge and on the effectiveness and the interconnectedness of our flood efforts of our habitat restoration efforts of our green belt and recreation efforts water has so many facets to it and we're setting ourselves up as a city to create a plan that appreciates all those facets holds them in relationship to each other and then prioritizes projects and policies moving forward so that we will be delivering great value for Clive residents and businesses there are four items in the proposed plan that I specifically wanted to identify for the council since I know these have been important issues in the past. One is stakeholder and community engagement. Um, whether we're talking about erosion or whether we're talking about uh, water quality, we know we have many, many people in the community who care about these issues passionately. We also know we have a lot of stakeholders that care about this and want to see the city of Clive be successful and hopefully continue to be our funding partners. We've designed an engagement strategy here that not only creates a large public component, but then uh, where any member of the public will be able to come in and build up our education and offer recommendations, identify hot spots where we can continue to do better work. But then we've also identified a set of working groups that will bring together some of our knowledge experts. Each of these working groups will be led by a staff member. Uh, for the City of Clive staff member and then supported by HDR uh, teammates as well. That's the place where we can bring in some of those real experts and some of the partner organizations and some of our surrounding communities that share the watershed with us. There's no way that the City of Clive can get this work done as we've heard over and over again from Doug and others. Their work is just too big. It really will require a broad partnership with players to get good work done. The second point I wanted to call out was the HDR Econ H2O tool which is one of the real reasons the firm differentiated itself when it was bidding for the work and, and among really excellent competition. 
This is a tool that will allow us the, allow the council to weight projects based on certain policy and other outcomes that they want to achieve, and then take things that on first blush don't look like they maybe have a lot in common, would be difficult to compare, but assign a value to that type of a project, and then schedule it based on what kind of outcomes it will achieve, and then also schedule it based on what kind of resources we, get, we have to put against the project. This is the same kind of tool that we've developed when we're talking about our sewer projects and with our streets projects. It's also a tool that's absolutely essential to understanding some of the trade-offs and opportunities for the future of the stormwater utility, which as we all know is something that our council and staff have paid great attention to uh, because the stormwater issues in Clive and other water resources issues in Clive are so important. The last two I would uh, mention uh, are one that Yes, the city has done enormous work in this area before. This is a plan that's designed again to weave together those threads that we've already, that we already have in hand, put them into a, a fabric that gives us a complete view and a plan for how we move forward. It is not a plan that is going to be duplicating work that's already been done. Uh, HDR understands and our staff understand that that would be a serious misstep. But it's also going to be a plan that is not so technical that folks are not able to uh, get into it and understand it. A lot of the output here on the communications and the education side is going to be creating video and other rich content that allows people to get into it, look at it on their phone, not get buried in a deep PDF. Now the technical appendices definitely will be a part of the work, but we are absolutely committed to creating something that is accessible to many, many different audiences and even some specific, what I'll call sort of buyer personas, people who care about water issues, but maybe know nothing about it right now. So that could be the buyer persona who wants to have that wet spot in their yard taken care of, or the buyer persona who wants to get a greener yard throughout the entire year, or the buyer persona who's very interested in urban conservation, or the person who absolutely loves the green belt. We've identified a number already of possible buyer personas in the scope of work. And there is some flexibility on that as we get deeper into the study and figure out what are the really the best hooks. The last point is parallel to this project, we also have the first district neighborhood plan. HDR's responsibility is to validate many of the ideas that are coming out of that. There's already another uh, very talented water resources uh, or team of people who are interested in, in water issues that are working on the first district plan that will be coming up with ways that we can continue to build that neighborhood working in partnership with folks who live there now and others. Uh, HDR will be looking carefully at those recommendations to make sure that they are uh, valid and can be implemented as well. And with that, Your Honor, I would be happy to take questions and I know Andy and Stephanie would be happy to take some questions as well. Thank you, Pete. Uh, questions, Council? Um, Pete, this is, this is Eric. Eric, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, I, I've talked with Matt a little bit about this. We've done a number of these studies and, you know, uh, studies, consultants can be expensive. The real expense is implementation of the recommendations right there. How do we build upon the number of the other studies, the four and five other studies that we, we've done, including the, the Greenbelt Master Plan, the recent study by Interflu? Into, uh, into really a comprehensive plan that we can take action on and move forward with. So I'll, I'll ask Andy and Stephanie to offer some insights on that too. I do think that the real power of this, one of the real powers of what we're proposing is that Econ H2O tool, because that is where we were able to bring a project like the uh, stream bank study that was just completed that has conceptual kind of costs associated with it but then compared some of those proposed projects with other water related projects in the city and then look at them, not just from what the cost is, but understand that cost and what it would mean potentially for the stormwater utility rate, what it would mean in terms of going out and leveraging additional funding to get the work done and what the long-term benefit of that project is relative to some others as well, not just other stream bank projects, but it could be relative to other grace uh, sewer projects, for example. And it's that ability to bring things that are right now somewhat locked up into just thinking about Greenbelt natural resources, just thinking about the, the gray infrastructure in the city, or thinking about some of the existing BMPs on private property and understanding them all together. 
I think uh, breaking out of silos is something that all big organizations are challenged to do, but that's the ambitious thing we've set up for ourselves in this plan. Andy, th anything you would add to that? One second, let me unmute Andy. Andy, can you hear okay. us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks, Pete. Um, and thanks, Mayor and Council. And the, the, the question about, you know, how, how can the, you know, there's a number of studies that have been done before and how, um, how can those be used or how, how can they be um, used to, to create a better future for Clive? It, it really, from our perspective, it comes down to, you know, the, the Greenbelt projects, it might be, you know, it's, it's thinking about, about these things from the perspective of water resources are all interrelated and budget dollars come from, you know, there's only, there's only a limited amount of money available. And so when you start to consider um, like a stable, a bank stabilization project or a recreation project that's in the green belt that appeals to and contributes certain benefits to the community, but then a, a BMP or a detention pond also contributes and has benefits and helps the city accomplish its goals as well. But when it comes to figuring out what what projects produce or result in the most benefits from the, for the city, then you start to look at and we can start to prioritize or rank different projects or different activities based on if they're kind of high benefit type activities or um, or high cost or both. And what we're looking for is within the perspective of Clive Water Resources, how do you start to operate more like, um, more in the way where you're trying to spend your money in the best, that for the activities that pro provide the most, um, the most benefits uh, for what you're trying to do. And so parts of what have happened before and parts of the studies before, you know, we'll be definitely, we'll be building from them. It's certainly, we're not duplicating efforts and we're not, um, replacing anything it, it's it's really we're building from that point of view and moving forward so one of the things I was particularly intrigued with and part of your proposal was to work with uh, various stakeholders on upstream and I can't remember the the acronym for SRI or SRO you talked about how how we can work with like the Iowa Soybean Association to provide incentives to lower the velocity of the water, which is, as it comes to Clyde, which is a big problem. Can you expand on that more a little bit, please? So it's the same, it's the same concept that, that a project may have multiple benefits um, to multiple stakeholders. And in that particular example, what, you know, what we were looking at was a, a wetland that would be upstream. And if it has, it has value to as a wetland, I mean, there's there's habitat benefits um, that are valuable to hunters or the landowner, um, but there's also there's also value in some flood storage and flood retention that could be valuable to uh, the city of Clive for having some reduced flood risk, and then it's also valuable if, um, if a wetland can retain and start to take nutrients and nitrogen out of the water, and so. Uh, that's important and, and has actual monetary value to the wastewater reclamation authority or the WRA. And so it's, it's trying to look for projects that have multiple benefits and multiple potential, because there's multiple benefits, there can be potential multiple payers for a particular project. And so that con and that kind of open, kind of open-minded thinking on some of these projects within the city of Clive, I think can help us, um, it, it can help us kind of assign the benefits to some of the projects, maybe in ways that you haven't looked at before within your city. Other council questions or comments for Pete or Andy? I'd move the resolution. Second. It's moved by John, seconded by Eric. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, will the council please vote? Yes. Thank you. Yes. 
Matthew, so you know too, Councilman Weaver's band um, internet connection was Understood. a little unstable and so he's participating by phone, so he'll be voting verbally. Item passes five to zero. Thank you, Pete and crew. We're looking forward to the results of that study. All right, uh, the next item is a presentation from uh, uh, Verizon regarding the proposed small wireless facility, a discussion on the proposal and the impact on the city's policies. Jeff. One moment, Mayor. There are a number of people Hello. participating in this discussion and I need to unmute them all one moment. Jeff May, can you hear us? Good evening, this is Jeff. How are you doing tonight? Hi, Jeff. Uh, good to, I got through here. Hey, I want to start off here and just kind of back up a little bit. A little over a year ago, uh, we passed our small wireless facility policy in April of 2019. Uh, after some review on our part, and review of that as the, as the policy developed and, and some of the uh, findings from the federal guidelines and the state code came about, we were by, did a little revision in November of 19 uh, based on some of the things that we found in our own policy that we needed change. Then after working with uh, Verizon on some applications, we had a, uh, another revision in January of this year, and that addressed some of the issues they had with our policy and some of the things that we needed to be changed, and those were outlined in the council letter there. As we continue to work with Verizon, we've come to the point where we're getting down to trying to get this approved. Uh, we have another issue with the design, and as you remember back when we started this, we looked at a stealth pole. We called it a stealth pole. Uh, Verizon has a smart pole, a little 20-inch diameter smart pole that's of the same type of design that we intended. But as we've talked to them, they don't feel that will work in our market and are proposing an alternative to that. Uh, they've asked and requested permission to come to you and present what their idea, and what their proposal is, an alternative pole, and that's why they're here tonight. We'll be looking at that. I guess there's a couple things we want to take from this. One is we'd like you to take a look at what they're proposing uh, we, we don't have pictures of what they're proposing. They will show them tonight in your packet was pictures of some other things and those are not what they're proposing. I want to make that clear. But as you look at that and you consider what they show you tonight, uh, if you feel that's is something that you would consider, uh, we need to talk about the code changes after that that would be necessary, kind of identify those code changes. Again, it's not specific to Verizon's, but it's a specific to make our policy acceptable to similar type uh, proposals from other applicants. So with that, uh, I think Verizon is ready to make a presentation to you. And Jeff, just to be clear, what they're showing us is not what they're proposing? What you saw in your packet is not what they're proposing. They're it's going not. to show you a picture tonight that we did not have, it was not available to us, that consider proprietary. And so they will show you on the screen tonight, but it was not in your packet. Okay, very good. Thank you, Jeff. Emily, this is Pete. Are you, will you be leading the presentation for the Verizon team tonight? Emily, we, we're not able to hear you at this point. John, I see your hand up. I'm going to uh, hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, John. Yeah, John we can hear you fine. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, members of the City Council, uh, Mr. May did a very good job of explaining, I think, where we are with this small wireless facility discussion here in Clive. Uh, Emily does have the presentation. Uh, as Mr. May mentioned, these designs are proprietary. We have designed them specifically for Clive based on some discussions we've had with Mr. May, Mr. Freestone, and Mr. McQuillan. Uh, we're trying as best we can to meet Clive's desired aesthetics uh, provided in the guidelines that are currently adopted. And it looks like Emily just got the presentation up, if everyone can see that. Yeah, we can see it fine now. Okay. 
so we wanted to show the city council the designs that we've come up with with our engineering team uh, with the caveat these are proprietary these are original designs we made for clive because these are proprietary we have not gotten mid -AM certification yet and we still have to work with our construction teams to make sure that these are feasible uh, our engineering team doesn't think these will pose a significant issue to either mid -AM or the construction team but uh, that's the reason why we can't show you, at least in the packet, the designs, because they're not finalized. But these shouldn't, at least we believe, provide a significant challenge to uh, our design team, our engineering team. So with that, Emily, if you're able to speak, I'll let her describe the designs and some of the considerations we were able to make uh, from our typical deployment options. We've been deploying these small cells uh, all over the Des Moines metro area. I'm sure you've probably seen them in downtown Des Moines as you saw in our packet there was one or two nodes in Des Moines and these deployment options that we're showing you tonight are similar to those that we have in some uh, the new neighborhoods in Omaha uh, these designs that we're showing you actually exhibit some additional shrouding techniques and blending techniques that uh, do a pretty good job we believe of concealing the radio equipment or at least making them not visually intrusive and I will give Emily a few more seconds to chime in. I'm not sure if her audio is on. A moment. But we do have a mouse cursor. I believe Emily's still maybe just trying to call in. Okay. Hi, sorry, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can, Emily, thank you. Okay, great. I just had to call in. I don't know what was going on. Um, I believe you can all see my screen with the, the photo sims that we have shown. Is that, can everyone see this? Yeah, we can see your screen. Thanks. I can see them. Okay, perfect. So what we are proposing is to top mount the equipment and this is 5G equipment. So it's three panels. That, and it's integrated antenna and radios. So it's all one, it's there, it's an integrated design. And um, so it doesn't really need that, you know, the stealth, I mean, it's stealth on its own, which is great. And it's very, it's much smaller than um, prior generation equipment. Um, and so then below that, we have a small um, surge protector and power um, shutoff box. Um, so that is what we're proposing and for this site. And it leaves the light at the same height as where it currently is. So I know that was something that um, was a concern. So um, we took that into consideration and moved it back. So we felt that the top mounted equipment, you know, kind of isn't as noticeable to um, people in the area. So I'll go to the next. So this is just a, a drawing of the same thing where it shows the height. And so the height will be you know, the same light that it currently is. Um, the very top of the pole will be 26.5 feet. So, um, you know, it pretty much maintains the same height. It's not adding anything significantly taller to the area. And then here is an, another site that we did a photo sim for. Um, this one is just a little bit different light height. So we did two different photo sims. Um, and so same thing, you see the top mounted equipment, the three panels surrounding the pole and all the wiring is concealed. And we color match the pole. So any color of the pole. Um, in Des Moines, we have a blue pole right now to, um, to match the surrounding poles. So we do try to integrate our equipment into the area and match it to the pole. Um, and then that is another drawing of the same equipment. Um, John, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I would just note that a question that comes up a lot for us is how often do we build our own poles versus locate on an existing mid-American pole? Uh, we try our best to locate on existing mid-American poles. Typically we'll replace the pole and then uh, increase the gauge of the metal slightly so that the new pole will withstand uh, the windage and loadage of our equipment. But uh, typically the pole is almost an exact match otherwise. It'll be the same paint color. It'll be in the same position. 
and uh, we give the pole back to Mid-American Energy. So it's their pole is just our equipment mounted on their slightly stronger pole in the same location. Uh, we're excited to work with folks in Clive to get the design guidelines consistent with some of these updated equipment designs. Uh, we really do want to move forward in Clive. It's a pretty high priority city for us in the Des Moines metro area. And we'd love to increase the service for our customers and for your constituents and bring the latest and greatest wireless technology uh, to your citizens. But otherwise, we're happy to answer any questions the city might have regarding the designs or about small cells generally. Your Honor, this is Matt. Um, and I want to have Jeff kind of speak to a little bit of our thought process here. You know, we don't, we want to be careful not to make it specific to one provider. Um, but we wanted to kind of talk through to the council and Jeff, you can go into this in terms of some of the things in terms of the vertical nature of the poll. And I'll let Jeff kind of speak to that. Yes. Uh, one of the things and one of the challenges, and I, one of the first things I want to say is this is just the 5G facility. And, and, and as we talked about it, uh, Verizon had previously showed uh, there is also the possibility at some point that a 4G facility will be placed on the same pole. That would be above and, and change the looks of this greatly. Uh, but specifically here tonight, we're just talking about this 5G uh, layout. Our, our original policy said everything is going to be located inside that pole. In other words, you got to put a new pole in and put everything inside it. What they're proposing here is something we refer to as a lollipop design. Basically, it's, it's going to be a circular type design that's placed on top of the pole. Uh, the idea being that we have the light remain at the same height so that it is as effective as it was and provides the same coverage as it did when it was originally designed. And then with everything above it at night, it would be up in the dark. Uh, it, it would be less noticeable, but also up there during the day in, in a way that uh, it, it looks like an extension on the pole possibly, but, but it doesn't look like a spider or anything up there hanging off. Uh, and something unsightly as we would look at it. Uh, the challenge will be, of course, everyone's technology is different. As we look at this, uh, we're not changing our policy to be specific to Verizon, but, but to change our policy to be specific to get the look we want from not only Verizon, but the other uh, carriers as well. Um, you know, some of the things we'd have to do as we outlined in the council letter was, you know, addressing the siting of it you know, what the standards and regulations are as far as, uh, you know, specifically addressing that street light time requirement, making sure that it remains the same. Uh, looking at some of the attachment limitations that we had previously, would have to reword this section to require all the uh, small wireless facility equipment and appurtenances to be above it. Um, you know, just several changes throughout there. I, I hope, I'm sure you've all had a time to read it. I guess I'd address each one specifically if you had questions. Uh, but, but in general, the idea is to write the policy to allow a similar type configuration on located on top of the pole that is somewhat circular or, or around the pole, be larger than the pole, of course, but, but not look odd hanging off to one side or the other. Hey Jeff, just quickly, uh, um, so on a street like 128th, uh, would this go on every other pole or what's the, remind me of the, uh, of, of the number of apparatus that need to be mounted to poles if this pr program were implemented? Well, I'm, I'm going to defer, but if I remember correctly, uh, you're looking at every three to 500 feet, you're going to need one of these, the way the 5G works. It's not like the one big uh, tower that's good for several miles. Uh, this is a, a small cell technology and, and they need to be every so often in order for them to provide the coverage they need. So it's not every pole, it's not every other pole necessarily, but it, it's quite often. So I asked that question because you, know, you mentioned the other providers that are out there and, you know, do, do we have enough poles ultimately to, to accommodate? Uh, good question. Uh, you know, We've discussed the co-location right now. We ask that co-location co be maintained or, or allowed. Uh, in talking with Verizon, it's one of the things we'll have to discuss. I think uh, it will be difficult um, to co-locate and, and provide two carriers on one pole. 
So yes, every every carrier is going to need a pole from 300 to 500 feet, and and they are limited out there in what we have. So my point is, is that this could look very different from what we're seeing right here. If you got if you got two or three co-locations on one pole, right? Well, my my guess is that each carrier is going to be on a separate pole, so you're going to have this similar look on every pole, probably, or or every other pole as the carriers start to fill in. I, I yeah, and, and Jeff, I, I hope you don't mind that I'm going to chime in. Um, for Verizon, we don't co-locate with other carriers, so we just put up equipment on our own poles. And I don't believe MidAmerican lets people, multiple carriers, go on the same pole. Um, so it would just be what you're seeing here. And, and Emily, one of the questions I'd ask you to provide for as part of this was a, a picture of the 4G and 5G together. Do you happen to have that available? I have, um, let me see here. Jeff, we didn't do one for the, the Clive designs. We actually don't, I believe, I don't believe we submitted any 4G permits initially last year. No, no you haven't, I, but as we talked. And it's, right, we've reviewed the build plan. It's unlikely going forward there would be a 4G node in there, at least now. Again, I can't guarantee anything going on in the future, but that, that's exactly right. But Emily, you you have it accessible gonna, maybe we could show the omaha yeah historic I'm district show design. what we put together for omaha um so this is a 4g 5g combination for historic districts in omaha and on this you have the 4g cantana lollipop on the very top of the pole and then you have the 5g equipment below that thank you emily that's that was the one i wanted to refer to and so Council, you know, at this time, Verizon is not proposing this, but somewhere down the road, this is a possibility of what the polls would look like. And I wanted to make sure you were aware of that as part of this. And Jeff, if I can add to your honor to, to Jeff's comments, I, I think what we were really looking at is for all the providers to keep with the vertical nature of the poll. Um, as you saw in some of other some other Verizon applications, like the one in Des Moines that was included in your packet, it has kind of that cantilever off of the pole that goes off to the side. Um, and as we were reviewing this and thinking through, okay, what what is the what is a place that we can get to which feels more stealth-like? It was keeping that vertical nature of the pole. So any, as you can see with the 4G application, they kind of have the lollipop on the top, but it keeps the vertical nature of the pole and and what we would do is write our aesthetics restrictions to not allow things to go too far outside of the, the original diameter of the pole to kind of prevent this appearing of attaching onto that you see in other communities that, that I frankly think is fairly ugly. And how can we keep kind of the vertical nature of the pole with the same color of the pole, um, have the shrouding effect to it, and then get it above the street light so at least particularly at night, we can, we can have even more stealth effect of you not being able to see um, the equipment at all. So that, that, so the, the Verizon provides some great examples of that, but again, I wanna uh, kind of go back to the kind of our staff's discussion in terms of how this, how this applies to other providers in terms of keeping with the vertical feel of uh, this application. And Matt, that all makes sense to me. But I'm going to come back to my question. Do we have enough poles if we have three providers, for example? And they all have the same coverage requirements. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, I don't have that answer. Uh, like I said, you know, our, our pole spacing is, is based on a lighting requirement as they start to fill in and, and they look for the coverage. Um, my guess is that we will have this on about every pole from the three carriers. Um, you know, for every third pole, if, you, if it's 500 feet, there's definitely, the poles are normally about, you know, 150 feet to 175 feet apart. You know, if, if you look at them, a, a typical 150 to 200 feet, maybe, um, you know, if, if they can do 500 feet, then every pole is more than enough. If they need to be 300 feet by technology, uh, we're going to be scrambling to find poles. Thank, I think to your question, Your Honor, I think it's a matter of the number of providers. I think uh, that's a lot of unknowns within this 5G space of, I think there's some obvious providers like your Verizons, your AT&Ts of the world, and how many may be in there in the future, uh, and which we can't predict. So there could very well be 
um, not enough poles if there's five providers, for example, just based on the way this technology is applied uh, today. Sure, a lot of unknowns. Uh, Matt. Thank you. Do we know, do the other carriers have the same policy as Verizon as, uh, where they don't share a poll, or are there any other carriers that are willing to, to share the same poll? I think it's more of an issue with Mid-American. Mid-American kind of sets the rules for their polls. And as Emily alluded to, and, and, and um, I have to take her word on it because I'm not entirely sure, Mid-American can say if there's no co-location on polls, there's no co-location on Mid-Am polls because they own the poll. So uh, and have to have to give that right. So I don't know if John, uh, you can speak to that at all, but that's that would be my understanding. Yeah, I think I can. So I can't speak to the future and I can't speak to our competitors' future build plans three, five, ten years down the road. I do know that Verizon, at least right now, is, uh, to my knowledge, the main carrier in the Midwest is pursuing the really high speed, lower range 5G equipment. In this case, uh, the equipment that we're showing you in this photo simulation. Uh, these are very, very high frequency, the really, really fast stuff that has as Jeff mentioned, a range of three to 500 feet, we'd probably say five to 700 feet, depending on the topography in the area and the height of the pole. But some other carriers, I know T-Mobile is doing more of a mid-band, which is a longer range 5G application that does not require so many small cells. That's a slightly slower, and they, again, I can't get too deep into the specifics, but uh, they will. their strategy at least is for less radios on bigger towers for slightly lower speeds. Uh, different carriers are calling 5G different things. So at least with our equipment, this is about as fast and as short range as it'll get. So I can't say that all three carriers are gonna deploy the same equipment in Clive, even over the next five or 10 years. I can say this is likely about the shortest range, highest speed stuff that you'll see. So it, we may not have an equal number of small cell sites from each of the three carriers. And, and I would like to reiterate that small cells are um, in addition to the big towers. So they supplement the big towers. So we still have our big towers that provide coverage to Clive, but then the small cells provide more capacity. So as more people are using their cell phones and watching videos and streaming and you know uploading photos, um, the small cells help supplement that. So we still have coverage with the big towers. So in some areas, you don't need a small cell because your coverage with the with the tower, the big tower is good enough. So we typically try to site these in areas of generally high demand, uh, higher uh, capacity areas, parks, uh, city downtowns, uh, places that our radio team knows that there's a lot of demand pretty regularly. And we also will put small sales in areas that might have a big spike, a local celebration a few times a year where you go from you know, a couple hundred people in the immediate vicinity to 15,000. So as Emily mentioned, these essentially just complement our macro, our big tower coverage map, but with much higher capacity, much faster uh, coverage in those specific areas. So it won't be on every single street in Clyde, most likely. It's not going to be on every single pole. It's going to be where their demand is. And especially as we build out for the next few years, we're going to start where the demand is the highest, where we believe that future traffic is going to be, and then we'll probably slowly, more slowly build out to the less high demand areas. Council, what other questions do you have for Jeff and for the group? Doing some research on 5G, one of the concerns was a health concern from the public on the the frequency and, and radiation exhibited by the 5G networks and 5G technology. What's your thoughts on this? And there's data supporting that or, or, or what, what is your thoughts regarding this concern? So that's a really good question. We do get that question in a number of different jurisdictions. Uh, I will say that Verizon complies with all FCC regulations. The FCC ultimately determines and uh, decides what radio frequencies and what powers uh, meet certain health requirements and regulations. We operate well within any FCC regulations and requirements and uh, probably can't get into it too deeply on this call, but I'm happy to forward the city a 
some of our material and some FCC website links that address all the common safety and health issue concerns and to talk about their standards and uh, what they consider as safe and the margin of error that's built into all of the the 5G or the radio frequency emissions regulations they have. If I can follow but up I will on say, that, I, Eric. Yeah, Mike, Mike, go ahead. Go Eric's question. I appreciate your answer, John, and, and you spoke of the FCC and the federal government. Sorry, but you know that the old they're knocking on your door. They're there to help. I think Eric's question was more of in, in Verizon's opinion, in your opinion, not the FCC on the health of these. So yeah, you follow all the regulations and all, but what is your opinion or Verizon's opinion on this? Um, uh, I can tell you that I have a 5G phone and I sleep with it next to my head on my nightstand. Have there been studies done on this particular subject and can you share those with staff? We can certainly send staff links to the FCC uh, guidance documents that compiles the hundreds of thousands of studies that they use to make these standards and these safety determinations. I, there's too much research for me to list off and uh, I really can't tonight, but I'm happy to provide links to the city so that you can do your, in, do your own independent research. Yeah, John, I mean, I'm just gonna chime in on this as well. I hear a lot about this from our constituents as a concern. And so the general question is, is, has it been proven that this is not a health hazard? This technology is not a health hazard. That's the question. Now, can you answer it? Or if you can't, then you can't. Uh, so I can't give you a yes or no. I can forward you to the FCC and the FCC has their determinations and their guiding documents. And I can tell you that we comply with all FCC regulations. Well, and the radio frequency that's put off by these small cells is the same as what's put off by a baby monitor in your home. It uses the same technology. So we, we have baby monitors and other things that put off radio frequency in our homes um, that, you know, I, I, I can't speak to whether the baby monitor, you know, poses a health risk or not, but we, we all have it and use it and use it for our benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to prolong this discussion, but that's that's going a little, a little. For me, yeah, I think that yeah. frustrates me. I don't have a baby monitor every 500 feet in my house. Uh, my neighbors don't all have babies. I mean, we can stretch that, and I, I'm not opposed to this, but using arguments like that are a bit insulting. And, and I can say that the radio frequency range is very similar to your Wi-Fi router. If you have Wi-Fi at home. Okay, very good. I think I think you're addressing the question as best you can. Um, so really, uh, Matt, Jeff, what you need is guidance from the council on uh, whether or not this this uh, design is acceptable. And if it is, you'll continue your work with Verizon to uh, uh, bring this to fruition. Is that accurate? If this is ahead, something the council would consider, then we will work on our policy as we continue to work the, with Verizon to make the modifications necessary to our policy to make this acceptable and make the modifications that would also uh, hopefully ensure that other carriers have a similar type of facility. It wouldn't be exactly the same, you know, everyone's got a little bit different technology, but we would uh, work on that policy to bring it back to you and we would need to have your approval of that revised policy before we could pr approve Verizon's permit. What I would add in addition to that, Your Honor, is we would also communicate with the other providers. I know AT&T has been in conversation as well, just to, to make sure everybody, all providers that we've at least been in contact with are aware of some proposed changes that we're looking at and make sure we have a dialogue with all and not just Verizon. And we just wanted to use this as a starting point to kind of get to a, a place of, of a aesthetic policy adjustment that the council was comfortable with and then we would bring that back, uh, as Jeff alluded to, for your formal adoption and amendment to the aesthetics policy. Okay, very well. Uh, what's the desire of the council? Um, kind of tough to see nodding heads around the table here. Uh, uh, Matthew, why don't you just kind of roll call yes or no if this is acceptable, and then let's, uh, let's move forward. Mm 
do this uh, voice vote or I can open up a vote, what you prefer. Well, I don't think there's a need this for This isn't it. an action item. We're just, we're giving, we're, right. we're, we're giving advice here uh, or direction rather. So if you just ask each member and they can say yes or no. Fine. Yes, and just real comment, this, this technology is here to stay, and I think this is a, a thoughtful and reasonable way to deal with it, so yes. Edwards. Yes, let's proceed. McCoy. Yes, with uh, speaking to all the companies, you know, prior to making any changes. Judkins. One moment, Councilwoman Judkins. He had me blocked up, so I couldn't yeah. unmute. But yeah. What's your desire? Yes. Thank you. Ted? Yeah, I'm fine with it. Looks good. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Jeff and group. Um, you have, have, uh, have the council's direction, and uh, we'll look forward to... Uh, out of your continued work on a complex, a very complex uh, technology and, and uh, thing that's coming for all of us. So thank you. All right, we're gonna move to discussion item uh, and it's regarding the COVID-19 update regarding financial impacts and reopening. Matt. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, circling back on our monthly discussion related to the financial impacts of uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, again, using the same uh, memo, memo format that we have been using over the last few months to provide those updates. Uh, won't necessarily go through every one of them other than to say on, on, on property tax, uh, we're in good shape, uh, just like pretty much like a normal year in terms of our collection. We, we're never really right at 100% at the end of the fiscal year. There's always usually a lag there for that last percent. So we're um, fully funded there. Um, on the hotel motel side, a little, one, uh, Kind of interesting change is we learned recently and there's a number of cities that are learning this now that the hotel motel tax collection was actually considered as a part when the governor did a tax deferral program as part of uh, uh, her proclamations that hotel motel taxes was considered in that deferment so that is a uh, part of the reason we're seeing the number be a little bit lower um, in the current fiscal year which again would have been the quarter at the beginning of the year, January, February, March, where we didn't anticipate as much of a uh, as much of a fall off, um, because well, in March we would have seen a little bit because of when the pandemic hit, but uh, we're learning more about that tax deferral element, and and uh, so there that would be a, a reason for a little bit of a additional hit in the current fiscal year. Uh, again, we feel comfortable that we're going to be in a good position in this when this current fiscal year ends next week. But wanted to make that note um, that that was a, a, some new information we've had we've received since uh, our last uh, discussion on this. Related to uh, uh, franchise fee, again we're at the expected scenario there. Um, again, hard to determine whether or not it's pandemic related or you know we had that less harsh winter, and that is uh, consistent from the, the previous update. As we go uh, into the other fees and charges, again, no changes here from the, uh, the previous update uh, in terms of where we anticipate to end. And then we'll have in our next update in July, we'll have the actuals of where we ended this fiscal year when the books are closed. Again, those will, those will be unaudited numbers uh, for the general fund and trust and agency fund, but it will be on just on the cash basis, but we'll provide that at our next update. Uh, sales tax, um, also um, a similar update um, in, in terms of the last time. We haven't received any new information from the state of Iowa in terms of expected reduction. We know there will be some, we just don't know what that is yet. Um, we did receive our targeted funding um, in this current fiscal year for sales tax. Again, as I mentioned last time, they will do a reconciliation and that reconciliation will uh, not take effect until November of the next fis uh, for the our next fiscal year, um, and then we and then it'll be dispersed over a number of months. Any re any reductions um, in sales tax receipts, but again, we'll talk more about this as we learn more from the state in terms of uh, sales tax revenue. 
Uh, road use was a was a surprise. Um, our last payment, based on what we saw, we collected about 95% of what we anticipated. So we thought we might be um, a little bit less than that. Um, and so we did make some adjustments. And so uh, we're in good shape on the road use tax fund. Uh, utility funds, no change from the May update. We haven't uh, seen any noticeable losses or any um, uh, so basically the same kind of a, a number of delinquent accounts that we have on a regular basis that hasn't changed. So overall, the uh, projected financial summary where we kind of get into some of the capital projects, this is one area that I wanted to talk to the council about uh, a little bit. So with us having the, the sales tax receipts in the current fiscal year be, be consistent in the road use tax fund in a better position, uh, we, we have been holding on one of the three uh, uh, pavement rehab projects, the arterial uh, street patching that we, uh, we had the council reject all bids, uh, asked the council to reject all bids uh, a few number of months ago when, uh, the, when the pandemic was really ramping up and we only received one bid and the bid was high. And now, so we've been holding that project for further consideration pending funding. I, I, we have to basically make a call on that in the next month. I'm leaning, or at least the staff is leaning towards uh, actually looking at moving that project forward and, and taking bids. You set the public hearing for the asphalt project tonight. Um, I think it behooves us to see what the bid environment is now um, for that, also for that patching, that arterial patching project. We may not get all of that patching project done in this season now that it'll be a little bit later in the year. Um, if we started moving that process here in July and, and, and we're able to get an award done in August, um, we would, but we would have a number of months to, to make some headway and then we could clean up items uh, next spring. Um, so it, I guess my sense is, is I think we could uh, move that project forward, see what kind of bids we get. We'll know more information. Um, hopefully on the sales tax in that in the, the two month time period before the council makes an award. And, uh, and then if we get good bids on that and competitive bids versus what we had the last time, um, move forward and then, and, and then fully, basically fully implement the pavement rehab program that we were anticipating for this year. So uh, that's something I wanted to, uh, one specific item I wanted to touch on with the council kind of for your discussion and thoughts on that and then again I updated the the table at the at the bottom reflecting a, a lower number on the financial impacts uh, mainly due to the uh, better receipts on road use tax fund than we anticipated. So with that your honor I, I wanted to pause here on the financial consideration and see what the council's thoughts were related to the um, potentially moving that third pavement rehab project forward. Thank you Matt. Um... I appreciate the report. There's a lot to think about here. Council questions and uh, guidance for Matt. This is John. I would say let's proceed with that project. We have the funding. It needs to be done. Yeah, this is Eric. And I don't think it hurts anything just to get the bids out there too and test, uh, test the environment as far as what costs are associated with the project. Others, council? I agree. I agree too. Agreed. Well, Matt, you have guidance uh, on the project um, to move that forward. Um, yep, that, I, that gets me what I need there. I think it gets trickier for us next year. Yes. I would agree. I think um, as we get into capital improvements planning this fall, again, have a lot more information on, we'll call it the initial of uh, this current status of the virus and the financial impacts and then any potentials for second waves or things that may happen in the fall. When we get into our deliberations in October and November on the CIP, um, really looking at the 2021 projects, that's where we're gonna, we're gonna have to revisit this conversation and what the potential impacts may be there. Uh, and then hopefully we have a we have a better read on the on the sales tax uh, local option sales tax revenue at that point as well. And that's something I wanted to note. And we also are hoping in July when we second meeting in July when we bring this conversation back and kind of talk to you about the end of the the this current fiscal year and kind of how the books closed. 
also coming back and talking a little bit about local option sales tax in terms of what's been expended for what and, and kind of do a close the loop on that. We want to do that on a regular basis to make sure the council's seeing, you know, what those resources are being spent on and how it corresponds to the things that we talked about in the, in the loss campaigns, uh, particularly as it relates to pavement rehab. Um, and then obviously the public safety facility, which is a major component of that uh, right now. Matt, I, I think that's very good that we do that. And I think we need to tell that story as often as possible because uh, I know it's important to the council. It's, uh, uh, it's important to our commitments that have been made to our residents. And so uh, I, I applaud that effort. Council, other questions for Matt on uh, what's before us? Otherwise, Matt, are you going to move to reopening then? Yeah, so I'll, I'll move to the reopening. We have a, a kind of a number of items to, uh, to discuss here. I won't necessarily go through the strategy. Um, obviously, it's quite a lengthy document. Wanted to share that with the council ahead of time. So the, we're anticipating reopening the facilities uh, next Monday, uh, allowing public access to the lobbies uh, with mask face covering requirements and then having the library reopen under kind of a limited capacity format of, of kind of 50% capacity with some, uh, a little more, a uh, little less hours than usually, it is usually open to try to get our feet underneath us in terms of what it looks like to have folks coming back into the facility and making sure that we are able to, to manage that and uh, um, have you know, folks at the door making sure that masks are on when they're coming into the facility. Um, I know I've outlined a number of the um, items that'll go along with that. But we're, we're um, excited to reopen our doors to the public. We are gonna still highly encourage folks if they can do um, uh, business with us online or remotely or via phone to continue to do so, particularly those that may not feel comfortable um, uh, coming in a public setting or, or, or choosing, prefer not to wear a mask. We still have those, all the options that we've been utilizing over the last three months. The library will continue to have curbside collection um, going forward on a regular basis to, to for, for those folks. We want to make sure we're serving all of the constituencies uh, that we can. Um, but we've got safety protocols in place uh, for that opening and we, and at this point, uh, plan to do so. Related to that, um, one thing I wanted to, a couple things is the, the mayor's proclamation uh, runs out uh, uh, midnight tonight. And uh, it is the, the mayor's and uh, mine's intent to, to not have an, a, a new proclamation moving forward. I think the governor renewed her proclamation today, really kind of based on, uh, I didn't get a chance to read through it in detail, but basically status quo of where everything is at right now in terms of uh, uh, reopening in the state. And she just reissued that for another month. And so based on what was included in the mayor's proclamation, there is, we really feel no need with the city facilities opening on Monday to reissue that proclamation. With that, I know the council also saw um, the small business grant program information that went out and the awards went out. We, we got some really good coverage on that, even on KCCI last night. So in terms of supporting the business community during these times, um, also uh, wanted to talk to the council about council meetings in terms of July. So we have the ability through the, the Zoom room and the Zoom setup to have a hybrid approach of in-person in the council chambers and virtual participation in the meetings and basically be able to keep everything going forward. Um, so I wanted to talk to the council about their comfort level with this. Some of our thoughts would be as we would uh, try to spread folks out at the council dais, we would have um, we'd be obviously taking a number of chairs out um, in the audience. Uh, we would probably, we haven't done the count yet and kind of the six foot spacing. Um, we would probably be able to have 10 to 12 uh, at, at the most in the audience. Um, we would still, I would still have staff participating virtually unless they have a, a very specific presentation item on the agenda where it's just easier to have them in the council chambers um, than we would have them in there. Uh, we would, uh, Chief Venema would help uh, with kind of monitoring the door in terms of the number of folks that can come in the room at any given time that we would try to, to, to have this format. I know a number of, some of other neighboring communities are, are currently, uh, have utilized this for actually their, their meetings either earlier this week or last week. I know uh, West Des Moines and Urbandale did a similar process and had the, the multi-option, if you will, 
for folks to participate. Want to also, obviously, for the council, that is the that option is also available. Um, if uh, council members want to continue to participate virtually, uh, we'll be able to see. You know, we'll be able to use video and actually see you on the screens. And Pete and Matthew have been testing this out in the council chambers of how this will work. And I, and I think it will be a tool for us, even post pandemic, of how council members can participate if they're remote. Um, which I know we've, we've had really just only the phone option. You know, now with this new technology that we've been utilizing, we've got some other tools here. So that's a lot for me, uh, kind of talking a lot there, but I just wanted to kind of get those things on the table and get kind of council's discussion or consideration of um, how uh, you want to handle meetings going forward. Council thoughts? Yeah, I totally support that. You know, a hybrid approach, I think, makes sense. Uh, a number of the boards that I'm on, that, that's exactly how we're doing it. It's kind of an optional thing, depending on your comfort level and, you know, what's going on in your individual life. So whether you want to show up in person or, or do it via Zoom or, or what have you, uh, every board I'm on is, is, is doing that exact thing. So I, I think that's that's the way we should approach it as well. For what it's worth, I would agree with that. <laughs> Others? Sounds like a great idea to me. Works that, for me. That sounds a good course of action. I agree. Okay, Matt. So that's very helpful, and, and if I could, and you don't necessarily need to, to let me know tonight, but if you could give me, for each of the council members, if you could give me a sense of whether you uh, anticipate being in person or virtually, that will help with our planning um, in terms of how we space out the chairs and, and make this work. One thing we are going to, um, uh, I, I would advocate that we require, just like we're doing in our public facilities, is, is mask wearing. Um, um, obviously for the public coming in and the audience, uh, we would require the ma uh, mask wearing to be in the council chambers. Uh, but I, that's again, another one I wanna reaffirm with the council on that. You know, we are requiring that in our public facilities at this point, and we would provide just similar like we're doing in all of our lot, we will be doing in all of our lobbies, uh, providing um, temporary pa paper masks if somebody doesn't have one. So wanna make sure I check in on that as well. I support that. Well, Matt, can you tell us if, if you're anticipating a four-hour meeting? I mean, that might uh, have some impact on which route we take. Yeah, I'll stay home. So. <laughs> That's a good call, John. <laughs> well, it's a great call. And, you know, it's, uh, the thing there is that, you know, we, we've got to abide by our own policies for the public. And... It's just the right thing to do. So I think that that you know that may have an impact on some members whether they want to to do that or not. And I think from from my perspective too is if you know if I do have uh, for example one or two council members who would be interested in trying the the virtual uh, being the virtual part of the virtual in person. That affords us the ability to spread you all out a little bit more at the council dais and then you kind of have that six you know i know the six feet number isn't the magic number but allows us to have some more separation um between you all and then uh you know if you're speaking if you want to have an option of lowering your mask you know that's i'm not going to obviously dictate that for my position but um just wanted to mention that, that that does afford us some opportunities to be able to spread folks out a little bit more up at the dais Other thoughts, Council? Matt, did you say you were getting shields as well? So I do have I do have some face shields. We've actually been distributing it to uh, the front desk staffs, um, at least the, the 10 that we were able to to acquire so far. Um, that's also that there that the council members have an interest in that um, as a part of uh, participating. We can definitely uh, get more if needed. Well. The reason I asked, each faculty member at Drake is being issued a face shield use when teaching. So it seems like there seems to be a trend there. We can definitely have one provided for you if that's the desire. I have one.
Okay. Well, it sounds like we have consensus on moving forward with hybrid meetings going forward into July. I think we'll look forward to that. And, um, you know, I, I think as a team, we're adaptable. That's pretty evident. Um, so let's move forward and, and you can discuss individually with Matt your preferences. Matt, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Anything else before we move to reports? That is it for me. Yeah, got it? Okay. Yes. Okay, then we're going to move to reports and uh, we'll go down to the other end of the dais with Pete. Thank you, Mayor. Matt mentioned we have a great story, but nice little coverage from KCCI on grants. We'll look for a few other opportunities to talk about that good win for the city and the businesses that have been fortunate enough to get those grants. Tomorrow, uh, we'll also be talking uh, with our media partners about sharing the word on opening City Hall and the library more than they are open right now. That'll be the focus of the story since most of the other changes with parks and other uh, parks programming and library programming were already in place uh, earlier this month. The uh, next week, we're going to be sharing the news about bridge jumping, uh, given the action the council took tonight, and also reminding everybody about fireworks, that if it flies or booms, it's not allowed in Clive. Uh, next, in, Jan in July, we look forward to discussing with all of you the resident survey data. Uh, we hope all of you have enjoyed looking into some of that and have been starting to come up with some questions. If there are places where you'd like to dig in, especially during the next one of the council <clears throat> conversations, drop me a note. I'm happy to talk individually with you about uh, any parts of those sur the survey that you have questions on right now or would like to dive deeper on. Finally, we're looking forward to starting the kickoff for the Water Resources Master Plan, and I will be calling on many of you to gauge your interest in participating in some of the working groups. Uh, certainly, we hope this is something we have a lot of time to discuss when we get to strategic planning in August. Thank you, Pete. Questions for Pete Council? Seeing none, we'll go to Ted. Uh, nothing tonight, Mayor. Thank you, Ted. Eric? A moment, I don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so, a couple of things. Uh, I participated in a, a, a Clive Chamber cleanup on the trail. Also, had a CB uh, Convention Visitor Bureau, CBB meeting and want to give you a couple of quick uh, quick updates here. Um, I'll give you kind of the bad news first. Uh, overall income is down 50% for FY20 and 21. So hotel motel revenues tax down 54%, uh, 180 event cancellations. Um, so pretty, pretty tough year so far as we've all anticipated with COVID. We'll say this, that we've also reduced expenses down uh, almost 30%, eliminating uh, six full-time positions, reduced production expenses down about 25%, operational expenses down 4.7%. So really, uh, uh, you know, working at a point where we're trying to take proactive measures to, to deal with the decrease in funding and do, th do that, uh, you know, proactively through, through uh, uh, positions and through reduced, uh, you know, reduced expenditures right there. Eric, thank you. Questions for Eric, Council? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Uh, John? Uh, just quickly, I think you saw that uh, Des Moines had passed a racial profiling ordinance. Uh, we'll take that up at the Metro Advisory Council at our next meeting. We're mm -hmm. guessing there'll be interest throughout the Metro in looking at uh, such an ordinance. So if you have thoughts or questions, let me know, but uh, we'll be discussing it at Mac. Thank you, John. Um, I would uh, share with the council that uh, last week, Matt and I participated in the uh, candidate interviews for Des Moines Water Works CEO, general manager. Um, that was a good process. Uh, and uh, of course, I think we all uh, uh, saw the, uh, the outcome of, of that interview uh, with uh, Ted Corrigan being selected as, uh, as CEO and general manager of Waterworks. Uh, we want to congratulate Ted on, uh, on his appointment and uh, for the work that he has done and will continue to do um, in the Des Moines region, um, bringing some of the highest quality drinking water in the nation 
to uh, to our residents. Uh, so we look forward to working with Ted and his team, continuing to, uh, particularly as we work towards uh, a regional governance uh, system uh, as it relates to the utility. Um, and uh, I guess I'll stop there, and Matt can offer comments as well when uh, uh, when we get down to him. Susan. Well, I serve on the Environment Committee for the Central Iowa Water Trails, and we met and heard a report from Strategic America, which is working on ideas to promote the water trails. So stay tuned to that. It'll be a real import to us. Um, last time I reported on the North Raccoon Watershed Coalition and efforts from a few in the northern part of the watershed to try to cut off the southern part of the watershed. Um, somehow Danell Eller from the Des Moines Register had gotten wind of that and has talked to quite a few of us about it. So I don't really know what angle she'll take, but um, there may be something coming out there. And then we have an upcoming meeting of the retail nodes group. Thank you very much, Susan. I appreciate your work there. Um, questions for Susan, Council? Seeing none, we'll move to Michael. I do not have anything, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Council? Yes, I would like if the uh, council and your honor would allow, I have um, feedback regarding the issue discussed earlier today on penalties related to the bridge jumping. You asked for it to be quick. So I have a slide I can put up if the council would like to consider that at this time, or we can uh, forego that for future discussion. I, I do have an answer for you, so to speak. Um, regarding the civil municipal infraction, the statute allows for a fine of up to $750, meaning we could ask for a lower fine on a civil infraction, um, but the court makes that ultimate determination. I have a slide here if you want to have further discussion or review what I pulled um, on each level of those enforcement options, I can try to do that. Uh, with the technology here. Council, what's your preference? Do you want to have, share the screen with uh, with Christina now? Let's look at it. Let's take a look at it while we're all together. If it's going to, if, if it turns into be something protracted, maybe we'll have to extend the conversation. But understood, Your Honor. Appreciate uh, appreciate the quick turn, uh, Christina. Thank you. Well, I had a legal team on the, tonight's call because of the various issues. Um, so I had a little bit of help in the research as we went along, but I prepared this slide to try to um, articulate or demonstrate the different levels that the um, police department and our prosecution team are analyzing. Um, starting here again with the verbal warnings, moving up essentially by what we would call um, severity. Uh, honestly, the criminal trespass, we believe as a scheduled fine, is issued for an on-the-spot correction um, in multiple scenarios throughout uh, municipalities. It is a set fine of $250, does not require court appearance or processing with an adult. When you move up to a criminal misdemeanor, it becomes a little bit more encompassing where um, it does require possibly two court appearances and not only would you issue the ticket, but the police department, because most of these folks will be juvenile, will need to actually have them appear at the police department, as I understand the process, with an adult for the issuance. The fine there, again, is up to, up to $500. Um, again, this could be actually a range of $65 up to $500 or 30 days in jail. Finally, to the extent it's not a criminal, um, not desired to be a criminal, violation. This is that civil municipal infraction structure that we have used in our code along with Iowa Code Section 364.22. What this is is a civil lawsuit that gets filed and served against a violator um, and there will be a civil trial on the violation. This is extremely administratively encompassing. Um, it requires again proper name, address, and service of the lawsuit. It's very difficult to issue this for an on-the-spot correction. 
um, it needs to be, the information is re, re, you know, recorded essentially at the violation, comes back, the officer fills out the lawsuit, the, law, the attorney signs it, files it, then has it served. It is administratively intense. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. It's more expensive than either of the other two options. Now, this does carry with it a fine up to $750 for the first offense and then $1,000 for the subsequent offenses. Again, we can ask for a, a fine of you know $100, but the court makes that decision. The code and the statute also allow for alternative relief, such as an injunction or just an order saying, don't do this again. So those are, an, that's the outline, the best I could you know, today to put that together for you and in front of the council. As I understand, our, uh, the council has acted and has in four, uh, enacted ordinance number nine, uh, 1095. Um, should you want to change this, this is the current penalty structure. Um, I would be happy to send this out to the council. Should you like to change what we, what we are doing or how this is enforced, we can take that up at a future meeting. Happy to answer any other questions as well. I guess my question would be for the chief, would it be workable, we meet I believe in two weeks, for the next two week period to give uh, warnings? Yes, we certainly could extend the, the one week of warnings to two weeks of warnings, if that is the desire of the council. Well, I, I'd suggest we think about that and then in this two week period, we uh, take a look at uh, this structure and uh, then at the next meeting, uh, take action if appropriate. And John, I agree. I add, John, if I could add just real quickly, based on when the publishing date of this will take effect anyway, which will likely be the middle of next week, we would only be at about a week of warnings anyway by the time you have your next council meeting. Okay. Do I sense consensus amongst the group? Yeah, I agree with that. And I still, again, this is just my opinion. I don't know what the chief thinks of this, but I, I still would prefer that we're, when we're given the warning that we're collecting the information on the individuals so that we know who we're warning and are able to be able to track that going forward. Um, and I guess my question is still, what escalates it to a misdemeanor? Is that our officer's discretion? How does that go from just the, the simple fine of 250 to a true misdemeanor? That is, criminal trespass is always a misdemeanor. It's just that uh, state code has determined that was such a, uh, a common charge that was filed that they decided to put a uh, a scheduled fine with criminal trespass. I believe they also do that with um, uh, smoking violations, tobacco violations for minors. That's a criminal charge, but the state has made a scheduled violation so you can just uh, write a ticket uh, to that individual instead of uh, having to bring them to the station oh. and having to make them sit and wait for a parent and all that. You can just cite and release. Right. And so does does that not go away when you turn 18 chief or Christina or is that per no, the, forever? The, 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 the criminal record, if, if a juvenile was arrested, no, the, that, uh, that any, uh, simple misdemeanor as a, as a juvenile is not going to be discoverable as a, uh, a with a, an adult criminal, uh, uh records check. When Simple. you say does it go away, I mean it's not expunged; it's just a sealed but, but, record. But but as the chief just said, though, if I'm an employer, you know, looking at a person's record when they're 22, you know, and they're looking, they're they're applying for their first real job, the employer is not necessarily going to see that. Is that an accurate statement? If, yes. If you run a criminal history, you're not going to get a simple misdemeanor conviction as a juvenile. If you look on Iowa Courts Online, which everyone can, you're gonna see that they had an interaction with the Clive Police Department. And let, uh, Christina, okay. you can correct me if I'm wrong on that on a juvenile 
uh, if uh, that would be open for, for public record. Hello, Christine, are you there? I am. I'm sorry, I didn't um, understand that as a question. I understood that as a statement to correct yeah, me if wrong. Christine, so, um, I didn't know if a, if a juvenile who's uh, cited for a criminal violation, if yep. uh, uh, that is searchable on the courts. It, I believe that it is. I don't know the answer. Um, I think what we're dealing with here, though, is the impression that a criminal trespass or minor in possession of a, uh, you know, who is smoking, they, they have essentially by policy been determined to be scheduled um, violations, meaning, oh, you know, not as big of a deal as, say, an assault, for example, which is more of the, that category of number three. <clears throat> so I, I, I come I back. Don't know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's searchable. Um, I think this gets to the point of, you know, is this a criminal? Mm -hmm. Is this illegal or not in the city of Clive? I think there's some significant risk with bridge jumping as we've seen and you guys have, you know, it, it, it's a fine line to walk, I appreciate. Yeah, I, I understood Ted's question to be, if it's criminal trespass, what gets it to a criminal simple misdemeanor? Discretion point. of the officer. Yeah, discretion of the officer. And we, so what I'd like to suggest, now, if I may, is that, uh, Christina, thank you. We take this information. Um, let's have um, some offline conversations and let's get everybody educated and comfortable with what all of this means um, as, we're, um, as we continue uh, to work through this meeting. Uh, and Chief, Chief will have enough time. We meet in two weeks. Let's come back and wrap it up and pin down the penalty structure of uh, that the council is comfortable with, but I appreciate Christina, you getting back to us uh, very, very quickly with this. It helps me a lot, and um, then we can uh, we can take some time to thank and deliberate and ask more questions offline, and then uh, and then hopefully uh, um, make determinations at our next meeting. You bet. We would welcome that additional question. I'll be sure to send this slide out to the team. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, this is, I, I just have an extra suggestion to go along with that, and that is, the, I, I think there seems to be a perception that it may be difficult for some of the young people to understand or know that this change has occurred, that we're serious, there is to be no bridge jumping. So if we could also have an explanation of how that information is being conveyed to everyone, um, I'm just concerned about any ambivalence that ends up being generated the longer we drag it out or leave any question as to how serious we are that we intend to cut that off. So, Absolutely, and I think, that, I think Pete has a plan uh, for, for media release and, uh, for lack of a better term, promotion of... Um, uh, uh, of our decision. Uh, right. so I, I just yeah. think that will relieve the anxiety about it and it won't be quite such a concern about what the charge ends up being. Okay, very good. Um, Christina, thank you again. Um, Matt, we're going to go to you. Hey, Your Honor, if I could add to that, um, our park and rec staff have also you know, made contact with the kids down there and, and tried to kind of develop a relationship and, and get to know the kids and I think we will use that as a medium to to uh, make sure that they're start they're learning about um, the council's desired changes and that the changes that are coming now that you've made this vote tonight. So that's another kind of communication medium direct to the to the source that we're also going to look at utilizing. A um, couple things that I wanted to mention uh, as a follow up to the uh, our last council meeting uh, in terms of the discussions related to kind of police policies and, and transparency and discussions related to that. Um, wanted to make the council aware um, something we were working on, uh, Pete and the chief and, and the lieutenant uh, have been working on in terms of uh, some communication tools. Uh, this is, relates to the, the eight can't wait items that have been discussed off and on and related to uh, police policies. 
this is a, um, a graphic that we intend to put out there uh, just to make sure that our, our citizens are educated in terms of where we stand uh, on those related items. Also, as I noted in your weekly update last week, staff is working on uh, kind of a uh, reports and accountability transparency webpage specifically for the police department. And that will be a place for a lot of information uh, related to some of the discussions we've been having and also provide a link uh, to Laserfish, our document imaging system for with all the police policies that we can show publicly. There's a few obviously related to investigation tactics and, and, and certain things that we don't necessarily wanna have the public to know. Um, but uh, that is the vast majority of those policies will be publicly available for, for anybody to view. Uh, also, um, the chief is working with Kalia to firm up the date of the public hearing related to the Kalia assessment in July. Um, we've got a tentative date and chief remind me is that, was that July 20th, I think was the tentative date, not the final date yet. Yeah, 20 through 22, but uh, we don't know exactly what occurs on each day. And when the actual hearing is. Yeah, the, the hearing, uh, I believe, is the 21st, but we have a, a meeting next week with Kalia to firm that up, and we'll, we'll pass that information out when we know it. Okay, thank you. And so we're uh, working on those things and also working on some uh, additional reporting information uh, related to that and obviously made some updates to policies with the new state legislation that was uh, recently approved. So uh, uh, good things happening there, moving forward on a number of items uh, related to that discussion from the last meeting. Also, uh, the city facility committee met last Friday um, to talk through project delivery options for the public safety facility. As many of you know, we were, we were hoping for a, a piece of legislation to pass this legislative session to provide some additional options for the city to consider, basically the construction manager at risk uh, format um, for our project with that not passing and wanting to continue to move the project forward. We are now looking at a kind of construction manager as agent process. Uh, doesn't uh, have the, the components we were hoping for with the at risk component where there would be kind of this guaranteed maximum. But we had a good discussion amongst the facility committee, uh, Mayor Circina, Councilmember Edwards and McCoy and our owner's rep, uh, Angie Fonku from Christensen kind of talking through all the options of whether you'd go to the general contractor hard bid or construction manager as agent and try to package the, the sub packages in a way where we can have some um, um, uh, a good construction process. Uh, after after a, a good discussion, we, d we decided to move forward with that construction manager as agent process and the RFP for that that Angie put together uh, went out today. Um, I'll be sending you all a copy of that and we're sending that to a number of construction managers here locally. Um, and we'll have a process over the next month to vet those and then bring, uh, bring that back to the council for consideration likely in August. Um, we are just finishing up the construction documents. Um, in fact, the, the chiefs and I have a, a long meeting coming up here soon to, to page turn through everything and, uh, and get all the final, final items um, uh, buttoned up before we, uh, and then also if we bring, when we bring the construction manager on board, have them do a, a constructability review and, and some other items. So that is where we're at at this point on the facility project and be happy to entertain any questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Matt. Council, questions for Matt. Good, uh, we get a quick update on swim lessons and the aquatic center filling and stuff. Yes, I actually, uh, Richard, I think I know you're on. Uh, do you wanna, did you wanna talk about that? I know we saw a pretty good uptick in uh, swimming lessons um, uh, that first week there. And I think uh, I'll let uh, Richard speak to that. Yeah, uh, Mayor, uh, Council, I'll just give you a quick update here. Um, right now we've done about $13,000 in swimming lesson registrations. Um, it's all over the board. We're seeing strong, um, strong response in the mornings and the night classes. A little bit weaker um, during the midday classes that we're offering, but working with my team to uh, put together some emails and social media posts that hopefully can get uh, that out today. Um, I'm sorry, tomorrow and over the weekend to really get uh, people excited about that. So I, I think we're in a pretty good spot so far. Um, we're also working with the swim team that was talked about at the last council meeting. And we think we're very close to working on an agreement where they would rent uh, multiple days a week throughout the, the six week period. So that's another opportunity for revenue 
that will also allow us to use some of the pool time. So I think we're in a good spot so far, given the, the situation we're in, but we're going to keep uh, working and getting things out there and really working at the community to get them in for a lot of these services. Good. One thing I would add to Richard's comments too, Your Honor, is uh, we, we have worked out some of those partnerships and agreements um, for the additional revenue and, and look forward to what that may lead um, to us in the future in terms of developing those relationships. Obviously, we had the discussion on that at the last meeting, but I think that's going to be a, a fruitful thing, not just for this year, but going forward. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Council, other questions for Matt? Hearing none, uh, anything else for the good of the order, Council? Matthew, any other correspondence? All correspondence were in your packet. Thank you, sir. Well, seeing nothing further, I'm going to adjourn us at 9, 10 p.m.